Okay. Looks like everybody's here. We are ready to start. Good afternoon. Welcome to the 439 session of the September 21st, 2021 meeting of the City Council. I have a few announcements and then we will move on to our meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on television, community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. If you wish to comment on an item today, at the beginning of the item you are wanting to comment on using the instructions on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. Please note there is a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. When it is time for public comment, press star on your phone to raise your hand. And when it is time to speak during public comment, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. You may hang up once you have commented on your item of interest. And I would like to ask the clerk to please call roll. Thank you, Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor. Council members Watkins? Here. Helen Terry Johnson? Here. Brown? Here. Cummings? Here. Boulder? Here. Vice Mayor Bruner? Present. And Mayor Myers is currently absent. Okay, I'd like to call on the city attorney to provide a report on closed session, please. Yes, thank you, uh, Vice Mayor Bruner and members of the city council. Uh, the council met briefly in closed session this afternoon to consider one item uh, involving potential initiation of litigation reportable action. All right, moving on. First up is the consent agenda. These are items number two and three on the agenda. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, now is the time to call want to comment on items two or three. Instructions are on your screen. Please remember to mute your streaming device, press star nine to raise your hand and listen for the cue saying you've been unmuted. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who wish to comment on or pull any items? I see council member Brown. I just have a question and there may be different specific answers to because they're different uh, emergency uh, conditions. Um, but I just have a, a kind of a general question about the process for this when <laughs> the time is appropriate. Okay, and council member Cummings. I had questions about um, items two and three related to the declaration of um, states of emergency. And so I don't know if they're the same as council member Brown's, but I do have questions that have come to my attention about declarations of states of emergency. Um, I, I'm happy to um, have any questions council members have responded to, I will ask Mary Haley to um, to enter the meeting. And good afternoon. Yes. Yes. This is Mary Haley uh, Owsley. She's an associate uh, in our office, and she um, assisted or prepared the um, the agenda report and the and the resolutions, and can respond to any questions, Council Member. 
Thank you. I'll just be real quick if I could. Um, uh, so I, I guess I'm just wondering, and we've been in a uh, seemingly perpetual state of emergency for a while now, um, really, I don't mean uh, just legally, and um, but we are kind of seem to be in this somewhat of a longer, the longer term phase of, you know, what's happening here. And, and so I guess I'm just wondering, is, are there some set of criteria that are used to determine, you know, in emergency, not an emergency? I mean, you know, you kind of like this, you know, when you feel it, you know, you, you know, when you see it, but um, how do we know, you know, and what, what will, will determine um, when uh, bringing, you know, extension of the, of the emergency declarations, it, if nothing else, happens for another emergency to occur. So are, just like it, what, how you'd make those decisions. It would be helpful to know a little bit more about that. Thank you, Councilmember Brown. To my understanding, there's no set terms when an emergency ends. Um, a lot of it is up to the council's discretion as well. Um, so there isn't a set, especially for something like COVID, where we, this is a probably a hundred year pandemic um, so it, it's really when the council decides there's no longer an emergency. And I, would, I would just add to that at this point in time, the primary reason for continuing to renew the emergency declaration, um, well, there are two really, both because um, the governor has not uh, lifted the state declaration of emergency. And the second is really the, the primary impetus at this point is to maximize the city's potential recovery of uh, FEMA or other uh, state emergency funds. And so, so that's the real impetus for continuing the uh, state of emergency declaration. Yeah, which, which I appreciate that that was included in the report. If there's just kind of a well, we've been doing this, and we're going to keep, you know, and we're doing it again. So I appreciate the um, a little bit more clarity. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Cummings. Did you have additional questions? Um, I that answered most of my questions, and and um, I'd also, uh, but I also wanted to ask, you know, as it relates to the CZU fire complex, it makes total sense to me for the pandemic why we'd want to continue that declaration because um, it's still like unforeseen what kind of impacts are going to hit the city and just to help recuperate some of those funds. But I, I'm just curious because now it seems like, you know, the fire happened about a year ago and, you know, the fires never really made it to the city, although we were part of that response effort and really helped with um, evacuations of victims. Is So I'm just kind of curious, you know, with, as it relates to the fires um, and the rationale behind the extension of the um, the state of emergency. Thank you, council member. I think for the CZU complex fire, um, quite a bit of it is, is that now we're in a historic drought and so we have historically dry vegetation. In addition to, I think that, um, sorry. <laughs> Right, let me let me jump in, Mary Haley. There's, there's the the uh, Mary Haley is correct um, with historic drought conditions uh, following the fire. Uh, we want to be careful, but the but the, the bigger issue I think is um, impacts to the watershed from the fire and not knowing what's coming this winter in terms of rainfall or not. Um, the burnout areas will uh, cause problems with the the watershed. So so that's. That's really the major um, potential impact that the water department in particular is concerned about. Thank you, that, that helps because I was, it wasn't clear, but now that makes total sense, you know, given the fact that we have the potential for debris flow since we didn't have major rain last year. Um, some of those areas are still pretty sensitive to that. So thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see, now we can move on to public comment. If there are any members of the public that would like to speak on any item of the consent agenda,
now is the time to do so. For nine, to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you've been unmuted. The timer will then be set for two minutes. And I don't see any members of the public with their hands raised. Oh wait, we have one uh, phone number ending in 0711. Star six to unmute yourself. Hi, my name is Sophia Alarcon. I'm a citizen of uh, Santa Cruz. I live in Live Oak. Um, I'm calling to, sorry, I'm kind of nervous. <laughs> I'm calling to voice my opposition for the oversized vehicle ordinance. Um, can I, we will be having comments on that a little later in the agenda. Right now we're taking public comment on items two and three, resolutions extending emergency declarations um, in connection with ZU, August Lightning Complex Fire by 60 days and in connection with the COVID-19 pandemic by 60 days. So if you um, can stay on the line and we'll hopefully get back to you when we come to that point in the agenda. I will move on to Reggie, go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Hi, um, I really liked uh, the question that Council Member Brown asked about um, the extension of the city manager's emergency powers. And I'm just wondering um, <clears throat> why this isn't kind of being questioned more. I mean, this is kind of a big uh, gift of power to the city manager. And it's not as though the city manager controls, uh, you know, health and um, human services, as we're constantly reminded, right? So. You know, this. what is exactly he doing for the pandemic? Why does he need to have this power right now? Uh, he doesn't seem to, with houseless folks, doesn't seem to be housing anyone, doesn't seem to take this responsibility in any positive way. So I'm just wondering um, if we can get an explanation about why the city manager has this power right now. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to call in, comment on items two and three on the agenda? Okay, I see that um, Mayor Myers is present. And are you ready to take over? Yeah, so uh, are we ready? I assume we are ready to look for a motion on yeah. item number three. I've got, um, thank you, Vice Mayor, for covering for me. Um, I see uh, Council Member Watkins and then followed by Council Member uh, Cumming. Yeah, I'm happy to move item two and three on our consent agenda. Second. Okay, great. We have a, a motion to um, approve the resolution extending by 60 days the declaration of emergency in connection with the COVID-19 pandemic. A motion by council member um, uh, Watkins and seconded by council member Cummings. And could we have a roll call vote, please? Council member Watkins? Aye. Helen Tari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cumming? Aye. Holder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. We'll now move into our general business um, agenda for the evening. Next up on the agenda is item number four, the 2021 Water Department Long Range Financial Plan and Water Rate Schedule for fiscal year 2023 to 2027. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order for this item tonight will be a presentation of the item by our staff 
followed by questions from the council. Then we will take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. I'll go ahead and turn this over, I believe, to Rosemary Menard, who is our acting city manager, as well as um, our water director. And so um, uh, we'll go ahead and turn this over to you, Rosemary. Thank you. Thank you for the for your presentation. Thank you, Mayor Myers, um, Vice Mayor Bruner, and members of the council. I really appreciate this opportunity to bring forward. Uh, I think this is my sort of last uh, for a little while specifically to water. Uh, I do, I'm keeping my hand in a few things, and this is one of them. And I do want to acknowledge as I'm starting this presentation that we have a number of members of the Water Commission uh, as panelists tonight. So um, I hope there'll be an opportunity if they have things that they would like to contribute. They've been our partners in a fairly long journey that started about a year and a half ago uh, to look at our long range planning and to update our uh, our financial plan, our, our capital program, our revenue requirements, and our rate study uh, So for the next several years. Uh, also tonight, uh, the presentation tonight, we'll be talking to, um, we'll be hearing from the, uh, the Iraq Telus Consulting team and uh, with their presentation about the rates specifically. So tonight, we're asking the council to do three things. Adapt the department's 2021 long range financial plan. This is an update of the plan that the council adopted on uh, June 14th of, 20, of 2016. And I think it's a really important document for us because it lays out in a fairly detailed way the, you know, what our needs are and what the issues are we're trying to manage and what the plan is for how we're gonna get from where we are to where we wanna go. Uh, approve the proposed water rate schedule for 2023 to 2027 for use in a Proposition 218 public notice process. And in your packet uh, materials has been a, a copy of the proposed notice that would be distributed to all of our customers here relatively shortly and we start the 45 day public review and uh, a formal protest period. And then to set the public hearing for November 23rd where you would actually uh, receive the protest that, that might be filed and also take action on the rates based on um, feedback that you've received, et cetera. So that's the overview of um, what we're asking the council to do. Um, presentation is basically in two parts. I'm going to do a, a presentation of the long range financial plan and talk to you about various aspects of the of the department's finances and what our needs assessments are and how that looks going forward. And then Raquel uh, Sanjay Gar from Raquel Consulting is going to present in some detail the details of the um, of the water rate proposed that are being proposed, including uh, something that I think we talked about a little bit at the April 6th meeting, which is infrastructure reinvestment fees and how we should collect those and also drop cost recovery fees, um, which are important to us because we are proposing to continue a very volume, high volume based uh, rate, which is important to our community, but um, has some consequences that we have to mitigate and manage for. So with that, I'm gonna launch into the conversation about the, um, or the presentation about the long range financial plan and uh, at the end of that, maybe we'll take a pause and see if there are questions from the council. Also, maybe hear if there are any comments from the Water Commission, and then we'll move to the second part. Um, so, uh, I want to. This presentation really talks about something that's really important. And as I've taken on this new role as interim city manager, I'm seeing the opportunities to use today's presentation to talk about financial planning and the conceptual model we're using for the water department in the context of larger financial planning and decision-making for the city as a whole. So this I may be pointing out opportunities where you'll be hearing some things as we go forward and looking at our uh, fiscal 23 budget for the whole city that would build on some of the concepts and principles that we're laying out here. Um, I'm going to describe a little bit about some of the key inputs and outputs, um, the operating uh, and capital that we have as major inputs, our financial policies that we're using that are also big drivers 
of um, our financial planning uh, effort, but also have impacts on, on our revenue requirements. And then revenue forecast. These revenue forecasts for the next five years, beginning with fiscal 23, are really the key to the process that uh, Raft Health Consulting has taken, which is in the cost of service analysis and then using revenue forecasts for the, for the future years to um, develop actual rates that would be necessary to recover the forecasted revenues. Um, I do want to mention as I as I go here, go down into this process that this work is very aligned with the interim recovery plan, the re Santa Cruz and specific areas. One is fiscal sustainability. This happens to be fiscal sustainability of a large enterprise fund that is um, operated by the by the city and that fully funds all the, the water department's expenses and also infrastructure investment. There's a very significant driver of got here in front of you that is related to investment and reinvestment in water system infrastructure that is designed to give us a reliable, resilient, and climate adapted uh, water system for the future. So these are things that I think are very aligned with the sort of interim recovery plan efforts that you've um, undertaken. Um, so here's the financial planning conceptual model, and I really want to talk about this in terms of uh, this box up here, which is the financial plan input. This is the what and why question. What are we going to do? What do we need to do? Why do we need to do those things? And to some degree, what are some of the goals associated with why we need to do you know, like financial reserves or uh, pay-as-you-go capital versus and those kinds of decisions. Why are we doing those kinds of things? The, the second part of it is the, the long-term financial plan that, you, that you've seen uh, as part of your packet. This is the big picture. How much do we need to, to um, raise? How much are our revenue requirements going forward? And that, as I mentioned, is the input into the um, rate-setting inputs where we make key assumptions about the volume of water sales, about the results of the cost of service analysis that it allocates to different customer classes, how much each customer class needs to contribute to the total rate revenue, and then looks at rate structure design and redesign as appropriate. And then we get proposed rates. And these are the how and the customer class specific how much. So these are the elements of the plan that you know, we want to talk about, and I want to share with you some of the major inputs. I want to also suggest that there's two places where values, community values, are really important. One of them is in the financial policies and goals area. It's like, what are important things? In, in another setting, you might be talking about what level of uh, contributions do you want the county to make to support, to support things like recreation programs, and, you know, how do we want to balance those values in terms of being maintaining accessibility for our customers um, who want to use those recreation programs. So in thinking about how this kind of model applies to other situations, you can think about financial policies and goals as things related to um, those kind of decisions that the council would make that are value laden. Similarly, over here in the rate setting input, the council members participated a few months ago in a process of um, prioritizing water pricing objectives. That's a value laden discussion. And your um, answers were basically integrated into the choices that were made by the Water Commission and the recommendations that came from the Water Commission to you on this topic and we're incorporated into the rate design process. And Matt Pellis will be talking about that a little bit more as we get down into the, their part of the presentation. Um, so just as a summary of the level of input, this is the operating forecast for the next five years. We do this thing based on the typical breakdowns you would see as part of anybody's budget. And a lot of what we do is based on a set of inflation factors that are different for different parts of the um, of the cost. So we have salaries and wages, and we have a certain inflation factor built in, benefits, operating supplies, and chemicals, energy, and then all other categories. So 
those revenue forecasts and requirements for the operating side of the house are driven by uh, existing experience as well as the forecast needs that we have that are influenced by these um, inflation factors. And then um, we have the capital program, and this is really the driver of so much of what we're doing these days. You can see that this is almost $271 million over the next five years. This money, there's no doubt about it. Um, as you can see in some of the line items here, there are some very large projects, uh, similar in size and scale to the current project that's going on up at the Mill Creek Dam, where we're um, putting in a new inlet outlet structure for the dam that has a $103 million price tag. And there are other projects that are, you know, more uh, sort of in a scale that sort of seems more doable. You know, it's raw water diversion at some of our uh, structures that's out on the coast structures or um, at the paid intake and also groundwater. But together they add up into a pretty darn robust and expensive, um, you know, commitment that we're trying to fund for improving our capital uh, projects. We've talked a little bit about these projects and these programs with the council members at the um, April 6th meeting where we talked to you about the process we went through with the Water Commission and the subcommittee uh, of the Water Commission to look at different alternatives for how we might, um, you know, phase out these projects to sort of address a number of, you know, both uh, practical limitations. You can't build everything at once because the water system has to keep operating during the entire time that you're building all these things. And you also have to sort of try to spread them out to sort of Met, you know, minimize and manage the rate impacts that are that are associated with them. But these are the um, these are the capital uh, programs and the, the sort of total amount from the council's direction to us to use these uh, figures in that came out of the April 6th meeting we had with you. Um, a number of uh, things we use here are our financial reserve goals. These are in incredibly important to us in both adaptive management, the, um, the uh, rate stabilization reserve, for example, has been a source of money for us to make up for lower sales than anticipated as a result of the pandemic. So this, this process that we put in place in 2016 to create a more robust rate stabilization reserve has really paid off and given us some uh, capability to uh, adapt to things as we've gone forward. Um, we do have a operating a reserve that is the sort of two different pots involving about 180 days of cash. These are really important to indicating to our uh, credit rating agencies and to people who might be looking at loaning us money, whether it's the state revolving loan fund or it's the, um, the federal WIPIA program, the water infrastructure innovation and finance, the infrastructure agency that has been created over the last number of years, or whether it's the, the debt market, the capital markets that we do um, go and approach for loans and, um, you know, use those, that loan money to invest in the capital system. Um, in addition, the emergency reserve is a really important thing for us to have. Three million when you have a billion dollars worth of infrastructure is not terribly robust, but it did help us to get through a number of issues, partly related to the fire and also related to a couple of, um, we had a disaster in our water quality lab that resulted in a requirement to do some rehabilitation and replacement of some facilities there that, that was paid for out of the, um, the emergency reserve. Um, these uh, revenue requirements, when put together, produce uh, annual revenue requirements that you can see here laid out. Uh, there is a kind of a lumpy uh, process here that's based on the idea that we've got a lot of capital projects that are coming due in uh, FY24 and FY25. Uh, normally, you would like to sort of level these, these out. If you did level it out, it would be about 10.8% a year. But unfortunately, the cash flow doesn't really allow us that of the way these uh, projects are 
are laid out doesn't really allow us to level this out. So this is the proposal of um, how we would go forward with the revenue requirement and um, with the sort of rate increases year over year for revenue requirement. I'm going to sort of talk at, uh, there's, a, there's a big section in the middle here, but while I have the floor, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, risk management, um, mitigating the risk of a heavily volume-based rate structure. And I mentioned this before when we talked a little bit about the COVID impacts to our um, lower than normal water sales. So we're recommending a continuation of the um, dollar per CCF charge that's associated with the increasing the rate stabilization reserve. This may help us mitigate the um, effects of changes in water use patterns from any number of variety of things that aren't drought related. And then we are um, we are recognizing that you know it's really important for us to. Um, establish that charge and maintain it. There's some uh, provisions in the financial plan that talks about what we will do with money that's raised over the $10 million goal in the event that we get there. And you'll see that there's been thought through in terms of how we can best utilize those resources to help mitigate some of the impacts that we're facing uh, throughout the, you know, through our whole sort of financial uh, situation in the water department. And then the second part is um, the drought cost recovery fee. Is this is uh, our current plan for reducing or curtailing demand during drought is basically can have a significant effect on our ability to raise revenue. And unfortunately, if uh, we had a you know a more sort of fixed cost based uh, revenue structure, rate structure, we would be mitigating some of this automatically, but we'd also not be maintaining the ability to make water um, affordable for essential use. And that, you know, having the current structure we have where uh, there is a relatively low fixed charge monthly and then the um, associated use-based charges is really makes it for someone who's not, not using very much water more accessible and more affordable. And so those are the, the um, drought cost recovery fee is uh, something that we have designed and had in place since 2014 actually, that allows us when the council declares a shortage to uh, implement this fixed fee and collect it over a 12 month period to help us be maintain sort of revenue neutral. Um, it's not a very popular fee, as you can imagine, and we don't like to use it, but given the financial commitments we have, it's really a tool that we need to have in our toolbox. Um, and I mentioned this basically already about using about $3.8 million from the rate stabilization reserve for COVID, and uh, that we did use the drought cost recovery fees from July 2014 through June of 2016. And as I said, it's spread out over 12 months to mitigate the monthly impact on customers. Um, and coming back, I wanna just sort of summarize again, we, we've been through a fairly detailed process of looking at what our operating capital budgets are and you know, sort of assessing the adequacy of our uh, financial policies and goals, creating a, um, a revenue requirement and now we're going to talk about moving into the next step, which is the rate setting process. So this is what I have in my presentation, and maybe we can pause here and see if there are questions or we move on or additional comments from water commissioners. Yeah, thank you, Rosemary. And I, and I also want to um, welcome our water commissioners this evening. Um, they've done a really, really amazing amount of work over the last two years. So I want to recognize you for all your work, especially as well of a pretty historic drought. So um, appreciate all the work and the work of your department, Rosemary. Um, I see that Sierra Ryan has her hand up. Go ahead, Sierra. Press there you go, you're in yeah. the Hi, Sierra. Hi, thank you for having us today. I just wanted to, um, speaking for the commission, uh, thank Rosemary for that great 
and um, you know, just reiterate her statements that this is something that we've been working on for a really long time. Um, I know this was presented to you in April, and um, at the time we didn't have the full understanding of what the rate increases would look like, um, which we do today and which you've already seen. Um, and I want to acknowledge that these are going to be painful, um, but I also want to acknowledge to be necessary. Um, the capital improvement program is really well thought out. A lot of work has gone into it for many years. Um, these are all pro projects and programs that are essential to our water supply security and really represent a generational investment in our resiliency. Um, so I don't have anything concrete to, to add other than answer any questions if you have anything directed towards the commission. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. I also see Doug Anfer is in, has his hand up. Thank you, Mayor Myers, and thank you, Rosemary, for that presentation. Um, I wanted to comment briefly on um, an aspect of the process that was relatively novel, but I think um, useful, and that was the establishment of the ad hoc subcommittee that was referenced in the materials that were shared with you, along with Vice Chair Wadlow and fellow Commissioner Alejandro Paramo. I served on that ad hoc committee. And we basically did sensitivity analysis around what is a, a massive CapEx budget, um, looking at various alternative ways to really structure that uh, in order to maintain our focus on resilience and reliability while trying to balance that with affordability and generational equities. I would just salute staff for coming up with the idea of establishing the subcommittee and working creatively and responsibly with the members of the commission who served on that. I, I, the, re, the rate structure that you see coming out of this does reflect, I think, good work by that subcommittee. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Are there any other questions from council or commissioners at this time? I had a question about um, the drought recovery um, fee. Yeah. I don't know if it's the right time, Rosemary, but I was just curious. I was thinking about um, federal and state declarations of drought, and and uh, I would imagine we would be able to recoup some of our losses um, from the system, uh, or you know, accommodate people somehow. How does that play? So, if you have an emergency declaration, oftentimes you can get resources to replace loss. And yeah. I'm just curious about how that relates to the drought recovery fee. You know, that, that's a really great question. Um, I am not aware that there have been FEMA designations for drought, you know, in this sort of classical way, um, but it certainly is something that we might be getting more into, you know, moving in that kind of direction just because of the extreme weather conditions that we've seen. Um, and then, as, as you all know from, you know, the work that we did when we talked with you about the drought, uh, the water shortage contingency plan, Santa Cruz's um, uh, water use is already tremendously efficient. And I think that one of the big challenges we have in sort of moving into drought restrictions is, is not a very effective way for us to, you know, you know, try to, you can spend a lot of money to try to cut people's use. Um, but the real solution that we have to get into is some kind of investment in water supply augmentation because it, it makes it um, it's not really feasible for us to curtail demand by 50% as described in, you know, some of those tables, the 50% per month, the monthly numbers are like really eye popping. And mm -hmm. I can't imagine us ever actually uh, implementing those in part because I think that it's they're not they're not feasible. They're we're putting them in because they're sort of required to be a match up to the five stages that the requires us to have in our plan. But really anything beyond maybe stage two is not a plan that it seems to me is viable for our community. And we need to be finding a way to make sure that we're not there and also looking at you know, ways to mitigate 
the cost of those investments in water supply, which it seems to me that proactive water supply investment uh, is a better way for us to focus solving that problem. There are some good resources coming out of the state this year and also the feds and we're watching them very carefully and are very heavily engaged and looking at how we can get the water supply reliability we need without necessarily having to deal with droughts in the future and you know this kind of curtailment and also getting ourselves a more reliable supply for our community. Yeah. Thank you for that answer. Um, just looking to see if there's any questions for from council at this time. Okay. We'll keep moving then, Rosemary. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to invite uh, Sanjay Garf Ellis to um, present the information. Uh, Sanjay is a is a slug, um, so he's a he's a local guy who drove metro buses to put himself through. Was that your PhD program, Sanjay? Uh, masters, yeah. Masters, yes. So. He's very familiar and well-loved in Santa Cruz, uh, has been with us uh, for the last couple of cycles of rate studies. So we've been very lucky to have someone who understands our community and this works so well. So with that, Sanjay, go right ahead. Thank you, Rosemary. Um, I assume you can hear me well and you can um, see the screen. And um, I'm, I'm impressed, Rosemary, you remember that I was at UC Santa Cruz for a few years. So thank you for remembering that. Um, also, I was, um, I also worked at Natural Bridges too. So I did that for a summer too. So I think I saw someone has a background on Natural Bridges. Um, so we'll get started um, with the presentation and the agenda, um, talk about the rate process, talk about the rate setting framework developed, proposed rate structure. Um, as Rosemary mentioned, we layered in the financial plan and the proposed rates and then drought rates next steps. There's a lot of information here that we are covering today. This has been a very um, extensive study. Um, and we actually, um, the city started in October 3rd with a, a request for qualification. Um, we got selected on January 14th. Um, we had our kickoff meeting January 10th, pre-COVID. Um, and then we adapted um, with COVID. Um, we've had several meetings, a lot of meetings with the Water Commission, with customer panels, um, I feel like we were pretty successful given the challenges that we faced by doing everything virtually as of today. We met with you also on April 6th to discuss the framework of the rate setting, um, and then here we are today. So it has been a long journey, a lot of touch points with a lot of different individuals, just to make sure we're on the right track in the study. Um, and that's important because this is an important aspect of your community. Um, this is a big study where we did a, what we call comprehensive cost of service, where we looked at your cost structure, look at your customer profile, and try to marry those two together. Uh, we want to do that because that is a foundation to develop a defensible um, rate structure that's equitable. Um, there are legal constraints with Prop 218. Unfortunately, there are people who are also suing water agencies over this. So we want to have a very strong logic and rationality. We want to have a lot of touch points with customers. Um, and we also um, want to develop what we call an administrative record, which is the next step of the study. We did drought rates. Um, we developed system development charges, which got adopted, as Rosemary mentioned. Um, we did a lot of public outreach. I have Matt Witterner on the um, call, too, if there's any questions about our public outreach strategy. She can, he can talk quite a bit about that. Um, and then the next step is an, this is an administrative record, which will be a very lengthy document that um, basically justifies, shows the logic with the rate structures. Um, we suspect some um, active citizens will want to read that report, which we definitely recommend and encourage. Um, we'll be available to answer any of their questions. Um, it's normal in the process. Um, but it just really shows the map behind all the rate structures and then the five years of rates. Through these, the steps that we conducted, we did a policy objective. We asked ourselves, what do we want to achieve in the rate structure? What are the goals? Uh, which we did. We looked at inside outside surcharge to make sure whether that makes sense still or not. Um, we'll be talking about that in a second. We talked about a, we did a wholesale transfer charge. Um, we looked at elevation surcharge, rate options, uh, infrastructure reinvestment fee options. We also helped set looking at the data. Um, we got new data, so it's really nice. Um, so we can do a little bit more refined analysis this time. 
as I mentioned, system development charge. I'll be presenting two options for no supposed ag uh, with potential reliability. We also updated private fire capacity drought weights, and as I mentioned, we did this extensive customer panel um, to get their input on what makes sense community. So from a process perspective, so those are the things we touched on, people we the touch points, but from a process perspective, there's really four steps. There's a rate setting, there's a cost of service, um, where we look at allocation of costs, we work with staff to make sure that makes sense. Um, and then we design rates and look at the impact and we'll, with the Water Commission and what makes sense and what's the, what are the values in our community. Um, then we layer in the financial plan, um, take that into account, fund the CIP project, which is reliability is the key word there. Um, and then we're basically now at this point where we're looking for your input, um, get another touch point with you to make sure we're good. Um, and if that makes sense, then we would proceed with the administrative record, Prop 218 noticing, and then set the public hearing. So the rate setting framework um, is basically a threefold process where we ask ourselves what are our goals and objectives, what do we want to achieve in our sector. We also start talking about business case in the sense of administrative costs and equity and um, what makes sense. And you know, there, there might be rate structures out there that are really precise and equitable, but just the business model to do that might be a bit too much um, given the limited resources that we have. Um, and then customer impacts. We really want to understand what it, what is the impacts of customers and which customers are affected mostly by. And so we did that analysis and we're going to be presenting you that information. Um, we went through a policy um, exercise with you and with the Water Commission. We presented these results on April 6th where we asked what are the objectives that we care about. These are the laundry list. Um, based on that exercise, we got these three priorities, you know, ensure water for essential use is affordable and uh, accessible, provide sufficient stable revenue to meet operating capital and customer service level needs, and to maintain transparency and equitable for water and capital and water reliability needs. And so there is a balancing act here. Sometimes there's a little bit of a conflict, but by achieving one thing, such as affordability, essential use, that's by having uh, low fixed charge, high volume metric. Um, then we uh, accomplish that by, for instance, having still maintaining um, the rate stabilization fund or similar certain amount of lower water sales to, to balance out those needs. Um, and of course, um, staff, you know, is conscious about administrative ease. Um, so based on that information, um, we go to rate structure. Just to remind ourselves, our current rate structure is you have a fixed and variable component. The six is this readiness to serve based on meter size, larger meter, more capacity, more cost to maintain the meters. You also have a fire line. Those are private fires uh, for fire sprinklers. Um, you have a consumption charge, um, basically residential four tiers. Everyone else except irrigation is uniform. I mean, it's the same rate like gasoline. Um, irrigation is a three tier based on water budget, where it takes into account lot size and weather. We have an elevation surcharge and rate stabilization, and currently do have an inside-outside differentiation of rates. So based on our analysis, based on a lot of workshops, these are our proposals. Uh, first is that the elimination of the inside-outside rate, um, based on an analysis, it doesn't make sense to do this. Um, it also helps with simplification. Um, residential tiers, um, we're recommending that that moves from four tiers to three tiers. Again, it simplifies a little, there's a little bit more simpler story there. Elevation surcharge, that one we are at, suggesting to open that up. Right now there's only one zone. We're suggesting that three zones because it makes sense for app, um, and there are additional costs in the higher zones. And then we also want to make sure we have a really good um, logic and rationality for the private fire line. Um, that's, there's been some controversy over that, and so we wanted to just, you know, really make sure um, we are um, on some strong um, ground with our logic and rationality for that. I'm moving relatively quickly here, so if you're safe, um, please interrupt me. I know there's a lot of information here, and I know you've all had a long day, or going to even have a longer day. Um, so the infrastructure charge currently collects $9 million. We really examined that. I would say this was the meat and potatoes of um, or maybe I shouldn't, I don't, most of us, I just, maybe the word meat's not the right word, potatoes, where we looked at the, um, <laughs> the different, uh, the different uh, rate structures, whether it's uniform, rate to serve, property, 
um, you know, how should we fund it? And we went through a lot of exercise, a lot of discussion about this. Um, and based on the pricing objective, based on the values, you know, we really feel comfortable with this tiered or commodity current approach. And that's what we're moving forward with. Sanjay, I just, yes. um, I'll interrupt just briefly. Yes. I see uh, Councilmember Colder raised her hand. I, maybe if she has a question on those most recent mm -hmm. slides. I did have a question, but uh, did you? But if, do you really want us to interrupt, or should we save the questions for the end? <laughs> I'm, I have no problem. So I just was confused when you were talking about the private fire lines. Are those mm -hmm. the residential like fire that people get in their homes? No, it's the uh, private fire lines are the ones that um, commercial like hospitals, hotels, the mall, those establishments. And so those you were saying an increased fee for those. Some of them may increase, yes. Okay, that's all I was curious about. Yeah. I understand. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Um, so the other thing we looked at is North Coast Ag. Um, we wanted to understand their needs and concerns. Um, and based on our experience from the last route, uh, what we wanted to do is really um, make sure we address reliability. Um, that's a key concern, as, especially as we enter this new drought. So what we've done is we've developed two rate structures for them. One is maintain the reliability like anyone else, so they will have curtailment when anyone else will have curtailment. Um, and so they'll just be like a, a typical customer. Another one is a decreased reliability where it's a seasonal interruption. By having a decreased reliability, they would have a lower rate. So these are two options that the North Coast Ag can choose on, decide, excuse me. Um, it's in the Prop 18 notice um, or the, well, the draft that's been developed, and they can decide whether they want to maintain the reliability or have a lower rate and decrease the reliability. That's up to them. So based on that, we have these four rate structure components where we have a fixed charge, what we have right now, customer service, meter maintenance cost, we have a consumption charge that takes into account the different costs of peaking, supply, conservation. We have the infrastructure renewal charge, um, again, a variable. And then we have the rate stabilization, um, which is not changing. Um, based on that information, then we layer in the financial plan. Uh, as I mentioned, um, we have the operating, we have the infrastructure charge, we have the revenue needs and the percent increase. As you can see, it's quite clear that we're really funding the infrastructure charge, and that's what this is all about, sound reliability. So with that, we go into the proposed rate. Um, the first one is that the tiers are changing. As I mentioned earlier, you currently have a four-tiered rate structure. As you note, and these are in units. Um, the units we use is it's called HCF or CCF. Um, you know, it's sort of a obscure unit that we use in the water industry, 748 gallons. Um, is one um, CCF. Um, what we're suggesting is that you notice that some of these are pretty tight here. There, there's not much of a difference in the units. So what we're suggesting is go to zero to five and then to nine, and then above that um, or above nine. Um, and that, and this is based on average winter use and average summer use. So there's a logic and rationality for that. Um, next, we have a series of tables that shows you the rate schedule um, for the readiness to serve charge and the commodity and et cetera. And the thought is, is that this would be the pop um, city council then could at the public hearing consider adopting them. And then, you know, you may want to revisit these as you move along, whether you need to implement them or not. So that's a policy decision that you can decide later on. Um, but these are the readiness to serve charge. So there's a lot of numbers here, um, a lot of information here. Here's the fire charge as mentioned. So they do go up a little bit more for customers. Um, again, for larger, um, the um, mall or the hospital or the hotels are typical. Um, here's the consumption charges over here. As I mentioned, here's North, North Coast Ag, where they do have a difference in rate, maintaining on the reliability, and they get to choose that if they want that or not. The infrastructure charge, we have the zones and the rate stabilization. So there's a lot of information here, right? And so as you mentioned, as you might recall in the beginning, I said, well, we want to know, one of the things we want to understand is what's this mean to my customers? What's the impact? So that's what I want to show you now. And then this is the, really the most important slide, or is, uh, the, the first important slide, and the next one might be considered the second most important. 
where we're showing different usages for a residential inside customer. We have two, four, eight, and 12 units. Um, most customers fall around the eight, um, or around the eight. Um, we have the bill right now. We have the proposed bill. We have the dollar and the percent change. Um, as you can see, those who use not that much water will see, you know, less than a two dollar increase. Um, some customers will see a little bit more, um, around seven dollars. Then, if you use a lot more, then you'll see a much more substantial increase in your water bill. Um, this takes into account the inside outside. This takes into account all, all the changes that I just mentioned. So there's a lot of moving parts here, but this consolidates it all. The second potentially most important slide is, you know, what does this mean compared to our other communities around us? Um, so this is a survey. Um, we're looking at six units. That's like the average um, usage. What we have here is if Watsonville, Marin, of course, Santa Cruz, Scotts Valley, Coastside, Soquel Creek. San Lorenzo and Montera water. Um, Scotts Valley, we're working with right now. Um, they have a public hearing, so they, they, they will see an increase um, shortly. Um, Coastside will also be, um, we're working with them and they'll see an increase in January. Um, so, the, you know, all these agencies are doing some kind of rate study or increase, especially with the drought. They're all facing the same challenges that we are facing. So, as you can see from a pecking order, you're still. Um, on the lower side compared to the neighboring communities. So I'm going to stop to here before I go into drought rates. It's almost like a, it is important. It is another aspect, but there's, I don't want to mix the concepts here. Is there any questions before I go into drought rates? Yeah, Sanjay, I've got two council members, uh, council member Golder and then council member Watkins. Thank you, Sanjay. You don't happen to have the previous side projected out to 27? The, to um, the, the rates to 2027? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. No, I don't uh, for the survey or for the customer impact? The, the previous slide, I don't remember what the title was. Yeah, the impact, no, I don't have that. Um, we could provide that to you. Thank you. Councilmember Watkins and then Councilmember Kontari Johnson, Councilmember Cummings. Uh, thank you for the presentation and um, for all your work on this. This looks really great. I guess my, my question sort of is on the on a bigger picture um, kind of perspective, if there is an infrastructure bill passed, at what how is that assumption or potential additional, particularly capital, uh, you know, um, infrastructure dollars being infused, is that not assumed in this mo model and we would make adjustments if and when that occurs or ho hopefully that occurs? Yeah, or I'm going to answer that one. Yeah, um, that's a great question. And so here's the here's the deal. So we've made certain kinds of assumptions in the, mod in the financial, financial modeling work looking at particularly the infrastructure with respect to how much we would likely pay for debt service. Um, and, and there's a table, I believe, in the long-range financial plan that sort of lays out what the current assumptions are in the model for SRF money, money for uh, market rate debt. And so we've used uh, those, those assumptions kind of selectively in the analysis we've done. The best outcome that we could get from the, some of the infrastructure bills is grant money. And one of the really good things that we are right now with our project development is we have a lot of things that are in the category of more shovel ready than not shovel ready. So uh, that puts us in a position to compete very effectively. The other thing I will say is that the current uh, SRF state revolving loan fund debt that we have is at 1.4%. So we have about $150 million in debt that is at 1.4%. And, you know, if you had a mortgage for your house, which wouldn't be $150 million, but uh, at 1.4%, you would feel extremely lucky that you had that for a 30-year uh, cost of borrowing money. And I think that uh, that, you know, the challenges we're facing is that we have a lot of work to do. 
Uh, we're in a historically uh, sort of low interest rate environment, so it's really opportunity for us to leverage that kind of situation, even if we have to borrow all of this money. It's way less expensive to do it at 1.4% than at 4 or 5%, which is in the original work that we did in the 2016 um, long-range financial plan, I think the debt a service assumption was more like 4 or 5%, which makes a huge difference in what you can afford to do. Thank you. Um, I just have one follow-up question then. In terms of being grant ready, I know we've talked about having the city be grant ready in a lot of different ways. Um, assuming that you know the water department is poised and has the resources um, or access to the resources so that when the time comes that we have kind of ready to go grant writers and access to right. Right. Yes, yes, we do. And and we're obviously following the work that just has come out of the state budget recently. There's about $650 million that has come out for uh, drinking water projects in just one category. There's a $400 million in a climate resilient uh, category. And we are working very hard with our uh, local folks to, you know, our, our representatives in Sacramento to get us the information we need to know when things are coming in terms of notice of funding availability and also, uh, you know, what projects we might have would line up best for certain kinds of pots of money. Great, great, thank you. Uh, Council Member Colin Terry Johnson. Great, yes, thank you for the presentation. Um, I wonder if we can go to the slide that says 24 on the bottom. Yes, um, yes, this one. Um, so my question is, do we have this broken down in terms of the, the percentage increase proposed between customer classes, resident, commercial, uh, landscape? Um, it just, as we look at it, it looks like residents are, the increase in residents in the various tiers looks significantly higher than some of the other classes. Um, so I wonder if we have the percentages and if you could just speak to that. Uh, we, so um, I have a tape, I don't have it with me at this moment, but we do have a table that shows that um, you, your observation is correct, that um, it does look a bit high here, especially if you look at tier three. Now, one thing to note is that there's not that many customers in these higher tiers. Um, so it doesn't affect um, residential as much. Where um, there are the biggest shift, though, is actually in landscape accounts, um, and that's that we wrestled with throughout the study is um, how do we deal with that? Because one of the challenges is that when we do our allocation of costs, we look at peaking, how much people use water relative to the summer, relative to the winter, and um, landscape accounts use a lot more water in the summer relative to the winter, so they are peaking more. And so more of the cost is shifted over to the, um, and so landscape accounts do see more of an increase um, than other customers. Uh, so I, I think I would add a couple of comments to this. The, the cost allocation uh, is not a, you know, take 2,700, 27,000 customers and divide equally. It's based on how various customer classes use the system. About two total consumption is in the residential class. And residential class, although they don't peak as much as um, the landscape irrigation, they do peak. And commercial class, generally, the commercial uh, properties that we have in our service area that use landscape, use water for irrigation, have a separate irrigation meter. So their consumption for that is in the irrigation category. They're much more sort of flat. In, in a sort of a general way. They're not peaking off the system in that in that sort of same way that, you know, somebody who's using, uh, you know, three CCF in the wintertime might be using six CCF in the summertime based on ir ir irrigation practices. So partly what you're seeing here is the effect of Alex costs from the, based on how different customer classes use the system and Prop 218 requires that customers be charged only the amount that is reflected in, you know, meeting that actually providing the service to them. So you do see these kinds of differentials. 
Thank you for explaining that. Donna, you're muted. I have Council Member Cummings and then Council Member Brown. I had um, one of my questions was answered because uh, members of the public were kind of asking those questions of why now to try to, um, you know, uh, get these loans. And it makes a lot of sense that, you know, if there's an opportunity to get this funding at a very low interest rate, that we want to try to really um, do that, you know, rather than wait and then, you know, have a higher rate at a later point in time. Uh, the one question, one of the questions I had, uh, if we could go back or maybe forward to the slide, just for clarification, when it was showing the HCF rates for the different, not that one, it was the graph, yes. So based on this graph and um, for clarification, uh, this is this uh, fiscal year 2022 bill, that reflects the bill for those types of residencies for the entire year. So based on this graph, those people would pay $32.46 at that resident for their water that year, and then it would go up to 3386. These are monthly charges. Okay. And the, the it's an example of somebody using CCCF, that's what their monthly bill would be. And you can see that it goes, again, the price, one of your priority water pricing objectives was uh, the uh, sort of maintaining equity, sorry, affordable access for uh, essential use, which wintertime consumptions and these lower, you know, numbers that definitely represent. And so the structure of the rate structure of maintaining so much of the revenue recovery from the volume-based rate is the way that that is accomplished very specifically. Got it. Okay. That was, thanks for the clarification because I wasn't sure if that was annual or monthly bills. Um, some other lifetime that might have been annual, but not this lifetime. <laughs> Absolutely. Unfortunately. I know, I was going to say that's pretty low, but uh, yeah. great. And then the other question I had was, um, a member of the public had, had asked, you know, why in terms of the timeline for paying back this loan, like it seems like this is a five-year structure and people were wondering, you know, why can't it be stretched out to like a seven-year structure or longer to kind of ease that increase in those bills over time yeah you will um you will recognize from the document that the, there's an appendix in the um long-range financial plan that has the 15 uh capital program in it this one has a, a pretty good sized chunk of money in it and i think that next 10 years is sort of a little bit more uh sort of stretched out spending but it doesn't go to zero so there's more money to be spent after this, and you'll recall from the, uh, maybe you'll recall from the April 6th conversation that we, there were several scenarios that were done, uh, high, medium, and low. They were um, originally laid out over a 10-year period, and where we got from the, uh, the sort of highest one to the uh, one that's in here is we spread it out over 15 years. So we've done that to the degree that we can. There is a there is a challenge with the kind of uh, some of these big projects and spending associated with these big projects. You stretch it out too much longer than you know we've sort of done in our plan. You end up with a, a higher cost because you know you don't you're not getting this project done. Um, and and I think that you know we are looking at uh, an ongoing inflation of construction costs, which is a challenge. So you know trying to figure out how to get this work done in this environment and this is a the stuff that's in this uh, five years is is pretty you know there's a few really big things and then there's some smaller things but the big things don't they don't lend themselves to being stretched out really really long time thanks and then so for the the individual residents that are paying their rates back the reason why it's that five-year kind of increase is because we really need to make sure that we're able to pay back in a timely manner so that we're not falling behind. Yeah, yeah, and I guess the other thing is that the um, maximum number of years that Prop 218 will let you do a rate increase, so sort of a year over year is five. So we couldn't do seven if we wanted to. Um, and, and I think that that's a, you know, that's, that's a challenge, obviously. Um, you could do less than five, 
and um, but you can't do more than five. That's that's what I was trying to get to. So that's really helpful. Those are all my uh -huh. questions. Thank you, Council Member. I've got Council Member Brown and then Council Member Golder. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you um, to our interim city manager slash water director wearing your water director hat. I I really appreciate again. I mean, I can't say it enough how um, how much work goes into this, and you know how well clearly explained it is, and yet I still find myself with questions. <laughs> um, so one of the questions that came up for me in conversations was related to the, the commercial class and why no tiering in, in that category, um, given that there are significant differences beyond seasonal among, uh, you know, commercial users. So like hotels, for example, may use a lot more water um, than, you know, another business function that, you know, clothing stores or, you know, whatever's left of those <laughs> those other businesses in our um, in our community. So I'm just wondering, is there, based, that's just based on the research. I think some of the answer is kind of implicit. I'm starting to feel like I understand it maybe, but I'd love to just hear a little more of the thinking on that in your model. Yeah. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, so that's a great question. A lot of um, agencies that would love to be able to tier commercial accounts. The challenge is, that, as you actually hit it on the nail, is that there's so many different types of commercial accounts. You know, you have hotels, even within the there's so many different types of hotels in your service areas. You have some larger ones, and then you have some smaller boutique ones. And, and then what makes sense? How would you tailor it? Anything we do to do a tiered rate for commercial would have um, quite a bit of administrative burden. Because you'd want to make sure that it's really designed to create um, incentives to reduce water, not necessarily to overcharge customers, just because they have a large establishment and they're very successful. Um, and so that's sort of the, that's the hard part. And so we did look at some ideas behind that, but again, based on the pricing objective, based on administrative ease, it didn't really make sense um, to do that. So I think one other thing that needs to be uh, commented on there, that tiers have to be justified based on the cost of service. So that is a, that's a really, it's sort of, that sounds like a bunch of words that, oh, that's obvious, but the, the details of how you justify that it costs you more to provide, you know, 100 gallons to this person versus 300 gallons to that person, it, especially when it's, you know, the, the pattern of this, it's different from the residential class where you see that, you know, the sort of breaking into those kind of tiers. But, but tiers are historically a vulnerability. And so when you set them, you really have to be able to justify based on the the cost of service analysis that you can, that they're justifiable based on actual analysis of cost of service. So we have Prop 218 to thank for yes, we that do. as well. Okay, thank you, that's really helpful. Uh, thank you, Council Member. I've got Council Member Golder next. Thank you, I have two quick questions. Has there ever been any discussion about creating like a similar structure like PG&E has? Customers can choose to to have your bill kind of balanced out, like they average out your last year's bill, and then you can take like um, a a flat rate kind of for that year, so you can budget. Um, we haven't done that, and and I think that um, part of the problem is that we haven't had the sort of uh, billing system infrastructure to do it. So that's a bit of a challenge. Um, it is among the various things that we can be, that we undoubtedly will be looking at over time as we go forward, just because, you know, more customers need that kind of assistance or it's a, it's a simpler way to make sure people can continue to, you know, get their bills paid and be able to afford them. Um, it is one of the things along with, you know, continuing to advocate for state and federal funding for low-income ratepayer systems and different kinds of ways that we're working on to help mitigate some of the impacts of, you know, the rate increases to those least able to pay. And then my my only other question was regarding the um, the 
the talk we had uh, several months ago about the possibility of adding the cost of the capital improvement property tax bill. Was there a reason why that was? So it turned out that that when the customer panels that we did, that wasn't a very um, desired. It, 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 there was a kind of sense of you know hiding the ball uh, and and the confusion associated with that. Um, I think it is a feasible thing, but it just, it turned out that that it really, it really wasn't a desired um, approach. Well, thank you. I think that is all of our current questions right now. Okay, so now I'll go to the next part, which is um, drought rates. And so drought rates are a surcharge tied to a specific drought um, mm -hmm. defined by the water storage contingency plan. It's designed to recover the lost revenue due usage. And it is um, proposed right now, to, and if you currently have one, um, but our, the, the proposal is to maintain that to do it based on a fixed charge based on meter size. This is a surcharge, it's temporary. So in the ideal world, we are, we're not in a drought condition, so you wouldn't even, we wouldn't even be talking about this. Um, so when a drought occurs, um, you would have this. Our recommendation is to use the same methodology that was proposed, that was developed in 2016. Um, when um, a drought declared, city council and the water department will implement corresponding rates, these drought surcharges, and they'll be collected over a 12-month period. Um, so what we did is, is we looked at your, your plan for a drought, and these are the different stages associated with them. It gets scary very quickly, I'll uh, be the first to admit that, um, especially when we get into these higher stages. Um, I know um, Rosemary um, has been very, um, uh, you know, her goal is never to get past stage two um, and just to stay at stage two at, at the most. Um, but, you know, these are, the reason why you have these are these are additional tools in case hopefully we never go there. But if something happens, um, I, I don't know what needs to happen for us to be in stage four or five, but hopefully it never happens. But if it happens, we're really rationing water because of an earthquake or significant fire or whatever that scenario is, um, we have this tool in our tool belt. It's also important to note when I show you the rates is that these are the maximum that you can uh, implement. You don't have to necessarily implement the full amount. So that's something that a city council, again, can consider as you go through this process. But you wanna have them adopted so you have that flexibility because of Prop 218. So as I mentioned, it would be um, based on meter size. One of the challenges that uh, we face is this reduction in, in lost revenue as the stages occur and the unit rate increases um, based on meter size. And that's just the nature of your system because people don't use that much water. So it's sort of a blessing. You don't use much water, so you're very good at the water stewardship. You're making sure water is available for the future, but because you use a little bit of water, when we ask you to cut back, it has even more of a financial challenge to the agency. Um, these are the rates by stages, um, and this is a fixed charge, a uh, monthly charge. Um, as I mentioned, again, the process here is, is that if city council um, adopts them, then when a stage occurs, you could consider whether you want to implement that corresponding stage or implement something lower, um, it creates flexibility. You could ask, um, there are other options such as uh, potentially um, shifting CIP projects out, which is not favorable, but it could be done, um, or using reserves. Again, all of these are not necessarily great, but it creates another tool in the tool belt in this um, dire situation. Um, the drought rates would be subject to the revenue adjustments um, that declare. So it is a little bit of a complex um, table because it's going to be five stages for each year. Um, so it is a lot of information that will be showing you. I'm just going to show you the five-year schedule for only stage two, which is, the, which is the thought process that we only stay at stage two or lower. We never go above that. And so here's the associated um, drought stages with the revenue increases that's needed in that year to fund the CIP. So again, the most important thing is what does this mean to my customers? How does this affect my customers? So we have a five eight inch meter um, here. We have someone who uses six units um, based on the proposed rate structure. They're going to pay $75.31. 
with a stage two, 20% reduction. That person does that, they follow that reduction. Um, there is a, now a drought surcharge here of $21.05. The bill goes up to $80.15. So they do see a slight increase in their bill, um, less than $5, um, but um, we still have water reliable for them. If that individual does not cut back um, and continue using the six unit, um, as you'll note that what will happen is, is that they will also have um, a penalty rate on top of that too. That will be charged on top of their um, normal rate. That will be um, on top of that. Um, is there any question about the drought surcharges? I just have a comment more than anything else. Um, I mean, I think this is what kind of, you know, as a, as a water, you know, customer, this is the most non, you know, counterintuitive part, you know, which is most people would want to assume their chart, you know, their, um, you know, their bill goes down because they're saving water, right? And it's really hard to explain that the unit of water still costs the same. And even though you're losing yet less, you know, it's still costing the same to get that water to you. And yeah. so I'm just curious, uh, Rosemary, how do you, you know, is there also, you know, communications kind of planning around this and other things? Because, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure these are the calls you got, you know, in 2014 through 2016. Um, and, and again, I don't, you know, it, it's sort of, why do it if we don't get some kind of financial reward? So I, I think a big, this is a big hill. This to me is one of the biggest hills to climb, you know, in yeah. terms of the rate stuff. Just curious about how so, you handle the, the so communication. The, the, the main that thing way. that we talk to people about is the fact that we have a really big mismatch for reasons that we've talked about of how we collect revenue versus for like. And about 92% of the water department's costs are fixed as opposed to variable, but about 90% of our rate uh, revenue is variable as opposed to fixed. So when we, people use less water, we don't save very much money on chemicals and power, which are the main two variable costs in uh, the production, and we still have to deliver the water that they are using. So it really is the unfortunate reality of taking fewer units and trying to collect the same amount of money, which means the price per unit has to go up. And it is terribly counterintuitive. And it's not, and this is not a, a, this drought cost recovery fee, a strategy that I think is totally wonderful and we should use it all the time. And in fact, the times between, we did declare a drought in a stage one drought in uh, 2018 and also obviously this year, we didn't impose the drought cost recovery fee in either of those cases and are kind of using the rate stabilization reserve to, you know, sort of more strategically deal with that. Um, but if we got into a situation further down the scale, some of the revenue uh, impacts of a 30% cut and not very much water use, it, there's, there's not a way for us to make up some of those gaps without doing something here. That's why this is in the market basket. And it's also why, from my perspective, the, the goal isn't to do, ever do this again, get water supply reliability such that, uh, you know, our customers have an adequate supply. They're not excessive users. They wouldn't, I wouldn't expect those use patterns to change, but that's what we, that's where I think we need to put our money and put our customers' money in producing that outcome. I have any other council member hands up, so I'll go ahead. Um, oh, sorry. And one quick question. So I guess under what scenario would we see this go into effect, given that you just mentioned that, you know, we declared a drought and it hasn't gone into effect this year? Because I, I know I've been approached um, about this issue already um, earlier this summer when we first declared the drought. And so I guess, you know, for us, it'd, it'd be really helpful to kind of be able to share with community members, you know, here the circumstances would occur so that they yeah. don't choose just because we declare a drought that this is going to happen. So, so the drop, uh, the water shortage contingency plan contains language and we're pretty sure it's in the muni code that basically authorizes the, 
the city to impose the job cost recovery be linked to a specific stage when the council takes action to um, to author or to state, you know, to establish a stage of the emergency, so stage one or stage two. It doesn't require that we do it. It it authorizes that to happen. And when we've been in stage one, either this year or in 2018, it just felt to me like wasn't something that was worth the headache, so to speak, associated with it. So we didn't do it. But if we have another dry winter and we go into next year in a similar kind of situation that we are this year, we are in the process of looking about, you know, and I shared some stuff with you in, I don't know, a few weeks ago when you came back from break about, you know, kind of what the some of the forecast looks like uh, for next winter if we have another dry winter. We are looking at, do we need to And one of the things we would have to look at if that were the case is, what is the fiscal impact on the revenue side of doing that? And we would bring you a very specific, uh, you know, recommendation related to implementing this in, the, in that event. Right, and then the council would have to decide on that. We'd have to provide authorization and approve. Yes, it's part of the resolution that, get, that, that we ask you to um, approve when we go into a particular stage of the water shortage contingency plan. Okay, thank you. Okay, Sanjay. Friday. I'm not seeing any other council members or um, commissioners, so please. Okay, so next step is to receive direction from city council, uh, prepare the administrative report as I mentioned, which is a lengthy document. Um, important dates um, are, of course, today, um, the virtual public meetings that will be happening on November 10th. Um, we would like to set the public for November 23rd. Um, if City Council adopts it, then it would be effective July 1st. Uh, we would need to start sending out the Prop 218 notice. Um, that needs to be sent out at least 45 days before the public hearing. Uh, uh, basically, the way it works is that um, if someone wants to protest, they, they, um, that uh, they can do a written protest, that's one for a so it must be received before the end of the public hearing. Great. So okay. with that, you know, we're ready to either have you take public comment or take your further questions or um, entertain it, you know, the council can entertain an action. Okay. Thank you, Rosemary and Sanjay. A um, lot of work, a lot of work thing, which is our water system. Um, I had one question, one last question was, um, the value, value, valuation of our system was pretty, um, was a big number, about $900 million. So right. we were thinking about <clears throat> what this means kind of in the, in the realm of things. Um, that valuation, how do you come about that? Um, and and it, it is that having that asset and those assets sort of described in a sense for our borrowing and, and other needs? So the valuation has to do with the replacement. It was calculated based on replacement costs. And so we took the assets that we have. We understand kind of we made an estimate about what their replacement costs were. We kind of know how long they've been in the system. And so, you know, what the, what the depreciation rate is. Uh, the way that the valuation is mainly used is in setting system development charges. Um, but it's, it's the valuation minus the capital program because the idea is that the, the people are buying into the existing system infrastructure and then for current and future rate payers will pay for the capital program. So uh, Sanjay, I don't know if you want to add anything else to that number, but it is a big number. It's a, you know, nearly, a, well, nearly a billion dollars. It's a very valuable asset for our community and really underpins so much economic uh, and you know vitality and viability and sustainability for our community, um, and it obviously didn't cost that in in bill. So Grand Mill Water Treatment Plant, which has this really horrific you know three figure in the hundreds of millions kind of number associated with the work that needs to be done there, was completed for 1.6 million, but it was 1960. So. Sanjay, do you want to add anything on valuation? 
Um, I mean, the main thing to me is, is in this process, it's, it's all about maintaining that value. Um, in some sense, the city, your, your, your job is to maintain this asset for a future generation, for current generation and future generation. And that's what we're doing through this process, is just to make sure that we maintain this value, because if we diminish the value, then it's, we call it mining assets. We're not um, making sure that it's viable for the future. So it is an expensive, proj um, expensive um, system, and that's normal, and, 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 it, you know, and you're doing a great job in having a plan to maintain it. Thank you, Sanjay. Are there any other questions from council members before I take this out to the public? not seeing any hands so <clears throat> well thank you Sanjay for joining us this evening um, hopefully you'll, we have further questions mm -hmm. as we go into um, deliberation <clears throat> excuse me I'll go ahead and take this out to the public and I see um, so we are um, on item number look we are on item number four for those who may be joining us right now and this is our um, water uh, our water uh, rates um, water department long-range financial plan and water rate schedule um, and I see one person has their hand up in the audience um, it shows as MP if you would press star six to unmute yourself please go ahead Star six, you should be able to get. Yeah, hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead, please. Yeah, so I'm just curious with interest rates so low and the, the junk bond market, what it is, and just debt markets, what it is, have we ever considered just borrowing at 50% more than what we need right now? Because we probably won't get this opportunity to get such cheap money in the future. Usually we won't have uh, uh, comments uh, with qu with uh, questions with answers, but um, our staff will definitely take note of that, and uh, we will uh, I'll look to them if they do want to answer that before we take uh, any. Um, I will actually say something about that. If you borrow money in the sort of just the sort of standard debt market, typically it's a three-year. You need to borrow spend what you're going to borrow in within a three-year period. Um, so it is. Uh, it's not. You can't. We cannot, from a financial management and securities management perspective, uh, you can't do what is being suggested here, although I'm sure a lot of people have thought it would be a good idea. Thank you for clarifying that. Are there any other uh, folks in the audience tonight who uh, wish to speak to this item? I'm not their hand, so I'll bring this back to Council for further deliberation. And uh, look for either a motion tonight or further deliberation on this item. Uh, Councilmember Brown and then Councilmember Colin Perry Johnson. Thank you. Well, I just wanted to say thank you again to our water department team and Sunday for you for um, being here, really helping us move through this. Um, I just wanted to say, you know, I, I think that Chair, uh, the Water Commission Chair Ryan's uh, comment that these are painful uh, rate increases, but necessary, really sums it up. And you know, I, it's I hope that we can um, really invest some energy and time, and I know the Water Department is doing this into finding ways to on low income residents and fixed income residents and especially I've heard from people just talking like with my neighbors and um, and others about the you know it seemingly small increases for low water users is a significant hit for some much more than others and we can't do anything about that with our fee structure because of Prop 218. Um, another reason to thank Prop 218. Um, you know that that we do take that seriously, and that we just continue to you know do everything in our power to find resources to perhaps mitigate some of those um, cost increases for people with the least ability to pay. Um, separate conversations for another time. Um, but with that, I would be happy to move the staff recommendation. 
Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Con. Thank you, yes. I was also going to um, thank Rosemary and the team and Sanjay and the Water Commission for all your work. And I was gonna also move the motion, so I'll second. Thank you. Great. And I'll second the thank you to the Water Commission as well. A lot of work has been put in this, and I, and I really appreciate everything you all do. Okay. So we have a motion on the floor um, to uh, move the staff recommendation with a second. And um, it looks like we don't have any other additional comments or deliberation from council members. So I think we are ready for a roll call vote. Council members Watkins. Hi, and I'll third thank the Water Commission and our Water Department as well. Helen Perry Johnson. Hi. Brown. Hi. Coming. Hi, and for the record, I just want to express my appreciation for all the work that's gone into this and also just, you know, for, for our community to understand that, you know, we really need to invest in our infrastructure now um, because it's gonna cost a lot more if we delay and um, we really need to make sure that of, of all the resources we provide our citizens that water is, is one of those that we're able to make sure everybody has. Holder. Hi. Vice Mayor Brunner. Hi. And Mayor Myers. I'm I and I'll also just briefly comment that I think Sanjay really wrapped this up that we read so often about um, communities who haven't taken care of their most important resource, which is their water. And um, we hear stories, you know, all over the country and the world. And so this is an investment in the future and, um, you know, we're, we're paying it forward. And um, I certainly echo Council Member Brown's concerns. And I know we were able to provide a lot of uh, relief for and so I want to, you know, make sure that our department really continues that value of really working with people who are struggling um, and may not be able to make those bills at any given time. So I think having our for forgiveness program and, uh, you know, helping to leverage those drought, you know, those other uh, funds that help pay ourselves back is, is really wise. And so I appreciate the structure that you've put together for the, for the long range financial plan. So. Thank you, and with that, I'm an I as well. Okay, so we are finished with that item. I will then open up item number five tonight. And this will be um, <clears throat> an ordinance amending Title 10 vehicles and traffic at uh, chapter 10.04 definitions and chapter 10.40 stopping, standing and parking and chapter 10.41 citywide parking permit pertaining to the parking of oversized vehicles and chapter 16.19 stormwater and urban water runoff pollution control at section 16.19.070 discharge of sewerage prohibitive. And I just wanna note a couple of limitations tonight and I will open this up um, for my colleagues um, to introduce. Um, tonight we, um, we will uh, have uh, extra speaking time uh, that was granted to three groups. Um, those will be asked to um, use that, use two minutes for their extra. And um, Bonnie, I believe you've got the list, but I wanna confirm um, and we'll go in this order. Uh, Westside Cares, correct Bonnie? Right. So Westside Cares, you'll go first. Westside Neighbors is second. Mm -hmm. And then okay. um, uh, remind me of the last one, Bonnie. It's Stepping Up Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz, exactly. So we'll go in that order when we do take the extra time, folks. Um, and that, that will be the start of public comment. And then we will allow for um, 90 minutes of comments. And we, we're asking each speaker to have to keep their comments to a minute. Um, and of course, we'll have uh, a, a, several hearings on this item. So um, those, those uh, we're just requesting those things for this evening. Um, I will go ahead and from what I understand, I believe my colleagues, uh, either council member, the council members who sponsored this are um, gonna open this up. 
And I'm not sure who's gonna go first. Um, so I'll look to you guys um, to uh, wave your hand or take and open this item up. Is that you, Vice Mayor? Thanks, Mayor. Yeah, I'm happy to open this up. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. <laughs> um, so um, this item is stemming from um, previous council direction in June related to safe sleeping sites and the direction of um, for safe parking, identifying safe parking locations and to look at the previous 2015 ordinance. So this item has been built upon that and the three council members that we've uh, worked on this with staff, we'd like to introduce it tonight for public comments and um, bring it back for our first reading um, at our next, uh, 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 in October at a regular meeting. And um, I believe we can look at the, the agenda calendar to set that first reading in October. Um, so tonight, um, it's really an opportunity to get full public outreach um, for this item to introduce it um, we've already received a lot of um, um, very specific comments on the uh, uh, the ordinance amendments and some um, suggested changes and edits to the uh, amended uh, uh, content of the ordinance. And so we really want to make sure that, you know, we develop, um, um, a good balance of all of that uh, feedback and allow that time before we bring it back for the first reading. Um, so I, I, I'll pass it on to um, Council Member Colder and Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Thank you, I think I'm next. Um, so for me, this is something that I've been looking at um, since 2013 when I was appointed by the city council at the time to participate in a public safety task force. And there was 14 residents from diverse and varied backgrounds. And we spent the better part of the year being tasked with exploring like deep rooted issues affecting public safety, including but not limited to drug abuse and treatment, um, drug related crime, homelessness, um, mental health, gang activity, and the, and the increase in calls for service and what that does to our criminal justice system and just the complexity around those issues. And because we were such a diverse group of residents, it really required a lot of thought and analysis and most importantly, open minds. And there was tons of dis you know discussion and disagreements and collaboration. And at the end of it, um, after hearing from judges, lawyers, police, outreach workers, service workers, addicts, people in recovery, we brought forward 56 recommendations and number 35 was for the city to review and implement a strict parking and overnight camping ordinance related to RVs on city streets. Increment of muni code violations related to RV parking in the city of Santa Cruz. And then having lived on the Lower West Side for the last 16 years, you know, I see a lot of the impacts um, on a daily basis. And my sister and her kids just live on Delaware. And so, which is, you'll see in the presentation why that's significant. And so through this ordinance, we're attempting to address some of the behaviors associated with RVs camping on city streets. knowledge, like it's not perfect. We think that um, through modifications, we'll be able to address some of the issues such as fires, oil and black water spills that directly you know, leak into our watershed and into the Monterey Bay. There's litter, violence, drug use, and theft. In addition, and most importantly also, it gives people living in RVs more opportunity to um, increase services with the implementation of safe sleeping sites that haven't been there in the past and hopefully, you know, more stability and help um, improve their lives as well. So we're really trying to make this a win-win for everybody in the community, but we acknowledge that we're, we're, we want more input at this point. And so um, that's where we are tonight. I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Colin Perry Johnson. Thank you, Vice Mayor Brunner and um, Council Member Golder um, provided a pretty good description. I think, you know, what I would add is um, 
I'll pick up where Councilmember Golder kind of just left off is that that we want to use this as an opportunity to expand the pipeline program we have in place um, with this uh, city-sponsored safe parking program. Um, we have been in conversation with um, service providers in the faith community to um, look at cost sharing and, and supporting the programs that are in place to expand those. We've also been talking to um, county partners on um, identifying sites in unincorporated areas. So we're using this opportunity to um, address um, as, as Council Member Golder just outlined, some of the impacts of uh, oversized vehicles parked on city streets. And, and there'll be some more details in the presentation that um, Chief Mills will provide momentarily. Um, so we're using this opportunity to revise the ordinance and address these very egregious impacts, impacts on um, housed and those individuals who are using their vehicles um, as, um, as a place to live. Um, they are also living in conditions of, of trash and human waste around them. So um, looking at the, the successes that we've had already with the safe parking programs, expanding that um, and addressing the negative impacts of these on our city streets. Um, I, think, I think the other really important piece that Council Member Golder touched on is every opportunity that we get we should use to connect folks to, folks to a pathway to housing. Um, housing is ultimately the goal that we wanna be reaching for um, and housing can be attainable. So, so that, that is something that we're looking at and what we've proposed tonight is that we um, form a ad hoc committee appointed by the mayor that will dive deeper into this. We've been working on it for several months, council member Golder for several years, um, but we really take the time to dive deeper into this to, um, form a, a response and a program that, that is responsive to the needs of everyone in our community. So I think with that, I will turn to Vice Mayor Bruner, who will get us set up for the presentation. Thank you, uh, Member Kalantari Johnson. I will um, hand it over to um, Chief Mills if if you could, yes, there you are. Thank you. Welcome. Well, good evening, Mayor Myers and City Council, and uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to present this information to you uh, to make sure that uh, we're all on the same page and that we, as said by several of our council members, uh, give the opportunity for the community to have a robust opportunity to weigh in. And uh, so I think what you're going to find in this presentation is that uh, opportunity for people to adjust uh, what is already there will be present. And uh, and that way we can move forward uh, with, the, with the assurance that uh, everybody's had that, that opportunity. So I'm gonna to try to share my screen right now. Not there yet, Andy. Yeah, I'm, I'm not finding it on my three dots up top. Hang on. Okay, no worries. You want me to share it too? I was just looking in the wrong spot. Not surprised. Can you see it now? Yes, okay. I can. Great. So uh, to um, begin with, we really wanted to make sure that uh, give you an idea of what's gonna take place uh, in the next few minutes. Uh, this is an introduction to the oversized parking uh, ordinance, vehicle ordinance. Uh, so that it's not, we're not asking for the first reading, it's just to give the information. We want to examine the, also the scope of the problem and the past efforts that have taken place in the city as uh, Councilmember Golder uh, had discussed a few seconds ago. And then present the proposed ordinance and amendments. And uh, Director Butler will take care of that portion since he has really invested a great deal of time, effort, and energy into language along with the city attorney. And then uh, we'll also discuss the formulation of an ad hoc subcommittee on the safe parking program. Uh, 
again, the purpose of the presentation is to, is to define the problems associated with oversized vehicle parking. And I think that uh, there's a great deal of frustration in our city uh, amongst many and so the community uh, looking at the problem. We want to introduce you to the ordinance language, provide time to examine and think about uh, think through the ordinance and ensure the opportunity to give council and staff feedback so we can make the adjustments if appropriate. But also I think it's very important to build the most fair, consistent and sound ordinance possible. And I really want to uh, give a lot of credit to our city attorney, uh, Tony Condotti, and for really putting a lot of time, effort and energy in this to make sure that, uh, you know, looking at case law and making sure that we are as constitutionally sound as possible. Uh, one of our uh, lieutenants just uh, retired early, Arnold Vasquez, it's his picture on the, on the screen there. Arnold's an interesting guy, he's a fabulous leader in our department. But something he said to me the last day of employment struck me pretty profoundly. Arnold joined uh, the police department in the 90s, the late 90s. And his very first call, the very first day, the very first hour of policing in our city was to handle oversized parking on Delaware and Natural Ridges. And he, and he you know, told how literally nothing has changed in 20 years. And uh, that is why I think this makes a lot of sense to me, that uh, we shouldn't have a generation of police officers retire from the city and not having had a substantial impact on the problem. In fact, there are probably those who would say, would say it's gotten worse. And we can look at data uh, around that, but uh, it's still something that has gone for a long, long period of time. We have received thousands of emails over even just my time, short time here, for a little bit over four years from community members regarding the problems out there, 400 plus from just the West Side residents regarding uh, not allowing people to park out there in a structure in a So this is acutely uh, an acute problem for many people. We've also had multiple meetings, both small and large, uh, both council and staff. I've been with at many of these meetings with some of our council members, you know, Mayor Myers and I also went out there a couple different times and many people were just frustrated over the uh, parking and some of the, uh, there's been decades of input uh, from the community. So this is not new to virtually anybody in the city. And then, uh, and, and we also wanna recognize that some council members and some community members have been actively involved in drafting and promulgating this ordinance. And so we really wanna recognize the efforts of many community members to have an input on this and to help lead uh, us to a possible solution or part, partial solution of the problem. So what's the goal? Uh, to me, and this is just me speaking, uh, the goal of the ordinance is balance. And I think that um, whatever we do in the city, uh, Santa Cruz has the reputation of trying to be as balanced as possible in how we uh, promulgate uh, policy as well as how we lead and enforce the law. Uh, we are mixing service options with enforcement capability. We can't have just one or the other. And I think that we all know that. So this ordinance seeks to balance uh, compassion and accountability uh, by referring people to services, giving them the opportunity to uh, park in a safe place, uh, you know, with structured environment, but at the same time recognize that if they continue to, there's a consequence for that. And, uh, and that the police department, as well as the parking department, uh, should be and are fully prepared uh, to uh, hold people accountable and leverage the law as best we can uh, to hold people accountable. So how big is the problem? What's the scope? Uh, there were 15 911 calls so far this year, not including 911 wireless calls, uh, related to oversized vehicles. Seven uh, were for fires, three were oversized uh, uh, vehicle fires. Uh, that's not just on the west side, that's citywide, and may or may not uh, result directly uh, to illegally parked vehicles. Fire responded to 38 vehicle fires in 2020 and 2021. Of those, three were oversized vehicles. Public Works responds quite often 
they responded to 12 oversized vehicles, uh, service calls, 14 public right of way calls, and scores of other cleanups and trash pickups from that are referred to them by police and fire. I just really want to give recognition to public works because we literally, in parks as well, we literally call them almost every week while we're cleaning large encampments and uh, they respond and they do a fabulous job as part of the team uh, to, to help uh, uh, clean up some of these problems in the city. So we really want to give some credit. So unmanaged parking and camping can lead to significant environmental concerns. This is our recent photo of trash on the sidewalks, uh, as well as you can see uh, buckets uh, that are often con uh, contain urine and feces that get dumped into our drains, which leads into our bay. And it can be a significant problem, not only here, but in some of the other unmanaged camps as well. It also is a significant uh, lack of access to coastal parking. Uh, people will park for long periods of time in some of these places, and I'll go into that in a little bit. We also do see criminal activity. In the last five years, there were 96 part one crimes uh, place at Delaware Natural Bridges, uh, Swanton, and, um, uh, and Schaefer Road. So that's a pretty high concentration. Uh, a lot of those were uh, assaults between people living there as well as uh, auto theft recoveries. So this is uh, data that was uh, gathered by the Westside Community Neighbors who put in a, a Verizon fix camera on a, on a light pole over by Cowles Beach. And I just want to go through, through some of the data and highlight it for you. 95% uh, of all people park for two hours or less. However, 6% consume parking at a much higher rate than everybody else. So 6% of all parking events consume 31% of parking out on Cowles Beach. Uh, that denies access to a whole lot of people. And, uh, and so when you take a look at the bigger picture, uh, and this is typical of you know both employees as well as crime, a small amount of people really consume the efforts of the majority of, of our services. And uh, you're looking at total minutes there's over a million minutes of, uh, of parking spaces that were blocked in our city. Oversized vehicle parking issue in some more context. In 20 and 21, five streets, Delaware, Natural Bridges, Schaefer, Mission, and Alamar uh, was 33% uh, percent of the problem. And if you look at it, about 80 vehicles out of all the vehicles that were ticketed and tagged, um, and pick it in and tag and try to move this around, I apologize. Uh, had three or more uh, 72 hour violations. So it's again, it's a small number of people who are creating the biggest part of the problem. And that's what uh, we seek to, uh, to deal with here. Uh, I found this interesting. This is what's called the trouble index. So the trouble index looks at 911 calls per 1,000 parking events. And see that the time of day, and this is military time on the bottom of the, uh, of the chart here. So from nine o'clock at night till four in the morning, you can see the spike in uh, 911 calls of, of parking spaces that are consumed. So theoretically, if we can control that, obviously you would, you could affect uh, the amount of calls to 911, which are crimes that are taking place. From the police perspective, in 2020, the SCPD uh, did 2,200 abatement calls for service and want to give a lot of credit to Joe Haby and some of our volunteers who go out there on a regular basis and, uh, and handle those abatement calls by tagging vehicles. Uh, and uh, of the 197 were oversized vehicles that were tagged, we towed 20 of those vehicles. In 2021, so far, we've done 2,400 calls for abatement services, 20, 294 were oversized vehicles, and 12 so far have been tagged. It might be a little bit higher after the operation a couple. Uh, that's 
uh, the amount of work that our folks are doing uh, out there on a regular basis. So where's the problem? 33% of all of our activity uh, is on the far west side. If you look at the concentrations of the heat map, uh, it's uh, mostly centered on Delaware, uh, Natural Bridges, and then Schaefer Road. And so uh, that's where most of the abatement activity takes place. Now that might be a little skewed from the standpoint that we base that on calls for service from community members when we uh, uh, go out there to do those abatements. So what are the barriers uh, to effective management of this, of this problem? Uh, the, cost, the cost of precious metals has dropped significantly uh, in, in the recent years. So therefore, it's no longer as profitable for, the, um, for some of the dismantlers, because most of these wind up being dismantled and, uh, and turned into precious metal scrap. Uh, the tow yards literally have no room for these vehicles. Each of these bigger vehicles can take up to two hours to load and tow. Uh, so it's an incredible amount of effort uh, on the part of the tow truck drivers as well as the police. And as you can see, this isn't just your little tow truck. This is a pretty good sized tow truck that takes a, a great deal of specialization to be able to do this in an effective way. Uh, the last time we did it, Public Works came out and immediately uh, sucked out all of the black water out of the, out of the thing so we weren't leaking it on the way up to uh, the tow yard. Uh, the tow yards uh, have no more room for the motorhomes and buses because they've just run out of room. So last year, we created our own tow yard. Uh, that's why you saw a dip in the numbers because there was no place to have these vehicles towed to. So we got creative uh, as a team and created our own tow yard and have had the uh, vehicles towed and stored up there until uh, the scrap metallers can get in there and uh, after proper notification can dismantle those. The problem is it proves disruptive uh, to public works operations. And so we've literally run out of space. We are over capacity and there's no more room to tow these vehicles. And so uh, um, this becomes a difficult problem uh, to, uh, to manage. The cost of, of, of towing these vehicles is not budgeted. Uh, as you can see, just the towing itself is about $1,200, between nine and $1,200 per vehicle, and that does not include the, uh, the scrapping of the metal uh, and having those things torn apart, nor the emptying of the antifreeze, the uh, ration, the black water, and all the other things that come with it. And each of those sometimes uh, uh, take different people to get up there and do that. So it can be pretty expensive uh, per vehicle. Uh, again, we just don't. That has not been figured into our budget at this point. So what are the resources? Uh, the resources available are 15 operational spaces in the city and 21 outside the city in the county. 13 of those are on religious sites and two on city property. The police department's uh, front lot has been used sporadically uh, by the AFC to house uh, individuals. We had a father and two daughters living on our front lot for a considerable period of time. And, um, and we were proud to be able to them uh, to use, utilize the lot. Uh, and here's the process we used. Uh, we informed neighbors uh, that this was going to take place. Uh, we defined the duration of the pilot project uh, for them. Uh, we talked to those in the program to make sure that they were ready and willing to behave as good neighbors. And then we monitored the progress uh, and to make sure it's uh, taking place. And then we assessed the appropriateness of continuing uh, this program. So uh, the result was we had zero calls for service, problems, or issues with those parking. Um, and we also know that they can also park on private business property as well as um, private residential property when appropriate. This has been a addressed before, as it was, was stated earlier. Uh, Public Citizens Task Force in 2013, uh, that led to um, the recommendations of a parking ordinance 2015, it went to council, was adopted 2016. The zoning minister approved coastal development permit to, uh, to uh, implement the ordinance. Coastal Commission uh, filed appeal on the ordinance in 2016, and it's 
there today. So how does this fit into uh, health and all policy? Um, you know, that's important to us as, as council has adopted this health and all policies approach and oversized vehicle ordinance will help control the flow of untreated urine, feces and other chemicals into public space. And uh, it could also help us reduce trash and litter uh, as well as some crime issues. Uh, equity uh, is important to each of us and the ordinance will be challenging for some of our community members. This, you know, we're pretty direct about that. Uh, although we know the council will hopefully direct us uh, to work with council and an ad hoc committee to establish safe sleeping sites, which will actually be those uh, who comply with the rules and the regulations of sleeping in a safe, uh, controlled environment. And then stabil uh, stability for our environment. Environmental integrity is the core value in Santa Cruz. We get that the oversized vehicle ordinance will help improve the environmental conditions, improve access to our coastal community for all residents and visitors. And uh, we believe that could be uh, something that could really be beneficial. And I'll turn it over to, to Director Butler. Thank you, Chief Mills. And good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Lee Butler, Deputy City Manager. And I've got a handful of slides here and we'll aim to quickly go through the uh, ordinance provisions. So um, the ordinance has a series of definitions and, and as uh, Chief Mills mentioned, um, the uh, council adopted an ordinance 15 and um, this ordinance has um, a number of changes associated with that. Um, these changes are um, incorporated into the presentation here, but all of the, um, uh, the overall ordinance is uh, attempted to be captured in these uh, handful of slides here. So there's um, unloading and loading that um, is defined and there are some exceptions uh, for parking uh, allowances when unloading and loading is occurring. There is um, a definition for out of town visitor um, that allows for uh, a permit to be issued um, for a uh, person that is um, uh, visiting a city resident. And um, oversized vehicles are defined um, in the ordinance as being over 20 feet long or um, greater than seven feet tall or uh, sorry, greater than seven feet tall and greater than seven feet wide. So um, the definition has changed. Um, and then uh, uh, the definition of resident is provided um, and you can see that here. We can go back to it if you've got questions. Go ahead and next slide. Um, the base of the ordinance specifies that there is no oversized vehicle parking between midnight and 5 a.m. Um, and um, there are permit allowances um, that would allow parking during those times and we'll get to those in a few minutes here. Um, the ordinance speaks to um, prohibiting um, utility connections on streets and sidewalks. It uh, prohibits open fires. It requires that the oversized vehicles, um, the surrounding areas maintained in a safe and hygienic manner. And there are limitations on where oversized vehicles can park, um, uh, proximity to certain uh, transportation features um, that like intersections that um, might, uh, where they could cause uh, a challenge with line of sight. And then um, no unattached trailers can be parked unless they're actively being loaded and unloaded. And then as I mentioned before, um, residents may obtain a permit to park adjacent to their residence or if that spot is not available within close proximity to the residence. Um, there are also some changes um, to Chapter 16.19 of the Municipal Code. That code um, already speaks to um, the prohibition on um, the dumping of material into our storm drains. And um, this uh, modification would make it explicit that that includes, um, but is not limited to disposal of sewage or gray water uh, into the storm drain system. The overnight parking permit um, 
does allow uh, residents uh, to have a valid uh, permit for one year and to park four periods of up to 72 consecutive hours per month. So a resident that's owning their RV could park it on the street in proximity to their house um, for those lengths of time. And then out of town visitor permits would be valid for 72 hours and uh, a resident may receive no more than six out of town visitor permits in a year. The recommendation that um, the council members brought forward also includes the, uh, the creation of an ad hoc subcommittee that would be appointed by the mayor that would be supported by staff and that subcommittee would develop policy direction on the expansion of city operated or city sponsored safe parking permit programs for unhoused residents and for um, registered oversized, ve oversized vehicles in the city of Santa Cruz. And the, uh, the recommendation that is included as part of the ordinance is that this would be implemented, the program would be implemented prior to enforcement of the overnight parking restrictions included in the ordinance. And that is the last slide. As you heard from um, a number of the others, um, the uh, council members are suggesting that we take public input this evening and bring the ordinance back for a first reading at a subsequent hearing. And I think we are all available for any questions that the council may have. Thank you, Director Butler. I appreciate that. I do have one quick um, uh, on the first proposed changes slide, just to avoid any confusion. If you could pull, are you able to pull that up again with the time frame? I believe it's midnight to 5 a.m. As a, it, I think it said 12 p.m. to 5 a.m. And I just didn't want to have any confusion around that. Thank you. Um, I, I caught that immediately before the uh, the meeting and changed it to midnight, but I think that uh, oh, you Keith just Mills passed there, it. Okay. Uh, it's uh, this one right here. Yes. Yes, it, it, you're, you're correct. Uh, it is midnight to 5 a.m. Um, and um, I, I think Chief Mills must have already had the presentation because <laughs> I saved it ahead of time. and. Uh, and so that it didn't make it in. So thank you for pointing that out and, and being clear for the public. Thank you. Okay, um, Mayor Myers had to sign off, so I will continue to move us forward um, with that. And so um, I'd like to bring it up to any questions from council members. And I see a couple of hands. Uh, so council member Colin Perry Johnson and then council member Brown. Thank you. I just wanted to also clarify that the last slide um, uh, said the policy direction for ad hoc committee to work on city sponsored safe parking, um, but that would also include working with county partners and faith community to do safe parking um, in unincorporated area. So I just wanted to clarify that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Brown and then Council Member Cummings. I have several questions. Is it okay if I just go ahead and they're sort of different overlapping? Go ahead. Okay. So um, uh, first I'll just say thank you. I'll, I'll save comments for later, but thank you for your work on this. Um, and I recognize that it is a, a serious issue and it's a serious challenge to figure out how to address it. Um, I um, am wondering, so one question, given the history with the Coastal Commission, um, what kinds of conversations have uh, taken place? Has that been an engagement with the Coastal Commission or has this been mostly around looking at um, legal framework in which those, and interpreting that in order to develop this, this um, proposal? Um, so that's one question um, and then probably because they're sort of different questions. I'll just start there and then go with the next one after. Yeah, what, like, what's the Coastal Commission say, if anything? Um, I, maybe I'll, I'll start that off and, uh, and see if anyone else wants to join in. Um, I have had a conversation, our, our parking program manager, Brian Borguno and myself, uh, had a, a Zoom meeting with the Coastal Commission 
regarding uh, the ordinance shortly after um, the council direction um, in June um, to get their um, uh, to get their take on it and to understand their uh, the process. Um, and um, they basically highlighted the um, the outcomes of the 2016 um, Coastal Commission discussion and um, noted that the Coastal Commission in particular at the time was looking for um, a better understanding of um, where RVs and oversized vehicles would be able to park. Um, and so they were looking uh, for more information on the affirmative side. They were also looking for some additional statistics um, related to um, the uh, the issues that sometimes arise around this. So, you know, trash collection and, um, and dumping of, of sewage and so forth. So those were the, the key items um, that we talked about. And I'm not sure if others wanted to chime in, Tony or, or Brian. Okay, I'll just fire off the next question then. Um, so, of the kind of the concerns that you know the the specific problems associated with um, RV camping um, around um, illegal dumping and some of the other issues that are you know um, quality of life. I think you is they may fit in that category that you have um, nuisance. Where it seems to me, don't we have laws on the books about illegal dumping? I mean, there's environmental health regulations. There's where are these covered elsewhere, and why can't we enforce using those? Um, I imagine that it's a it's a question of and there's logistical challenges and all kinds of challenges. But like, what about this is specifically going to enhance the ability to. Um, the city's ability to do enforcement on those activities. Um, and has there been any conversation about um, other efforts that the city could undertake in order to help um, mitigate those problems, um, regardless of the activity, you know, what, how much we can change behaviors or, you know, deal, like what can the city do to help kind of mitigate that? So where's that, that conversation at? And um, I guess that's for anybody who wants to take it on. I see um, Vice Mayor Bruner is shaking her head. Uh, so the conversations are happening. I'd love to hear more. Andy, do you want do you want to take a crack at that, or do you want me? To... Uh, we can both do a little bit of it, Tony. You want to go ahead and go first, and I'll I'll back clean up. Yeah. Um, the, so there are a lot of um, ordinances on the books that prohibit the kinds of nuisance conduct that are often associated with overnight parking or really parking of an RV for an extended period of time in one location. Um, it's not just the overnight aspect of it. It's the fact that it stays there and there's littering and there's other nuisance conduct that sort of builds up over time. Um, an infraction citation for littering um, can, can be written if there's a witness to the conduct and can and uh, verify that um, that it occurred and, and identify the person who engaged in it. However, um, what happens in these situations is that the problems tend to accumulate and get worse as the conduct continues. And, um, and, and just writing a citation, even if it's a misdemeanor, even if you could arrest someone and take them into custody. Um, the, the way the court process works these days is they would be right back out on the street um, within an hour and and go back to the parked RV and continue to engage in the kind of conduct that, that we're trying to address. So moving um, these vehicles along seems to be the only effective way to address some of the nuisance conditions that become associated with them. Andy. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, part of the issue with uh, crimes such as litter and illegal dumping is you have to have a witness or else you have to be able to articulate why this why this specific person did this, not necessarily that it's, that it's just there. So this would 
will give us the opportunity uh, to cite infractions at the infraction level or the misdemeanor level, depending on the circumstances, uh, and then have our own city attorney prosecute these cases. Part of the issue is the, um, the courts are so overwhelmed with other cases, virtually nothing is getting prosecuted. So, um, and we have COVID because of the, you know, much more serious crime. Uh, and so uh, the city attorney for us has had a better track record of getting these things prosecuted. Uh, to send that message that, look, this is not okay in our neighborhood. And we've written, I mean, hundreds of tickets, uh, both parking and uh, as other municipal code violations out there on the west side. And, and you know, it, it can help for a little while, but it comes right back. And so this, I believe, can, it can help us with the leverage uh, to make sure that people are not uh, doing uh, parking and creating those problems. And I just want to add two things. One is not necessarily uh, just unhoused individuals or those living in motorhomes. We get a lot of people coming to town from out of state who think it's just okay to park on somebody's street uh, for a while while they're on a surf trip or while they're vacation. Uh, this would address all of that uh, and not just those who are in house, although it does address that. And then the second part of your question, uh, Council Member Brown, was are there other things that we're doing uh, to mitigate that? And yes, um, we are consistently warning people and providing them with contact information to AFC, uh, with communities to uh, be part of the parking program. There are other options available to people should they desire to do that. As well as public works, um, we put dumpsters at different locations. There's a dumpster out there uh, right now at the corner of um, um, Schaefer. Oh, Schaefer. Yeah, Schaefer. And, uh, and you know, those get filled up and dumped regularly. So I think city staff is really doing what we can uh, to, to try to keep that fairly orderly and give people the opportunity uh, to police them, you know, police their locations themselves. And uh, uh, that's effective at certain levels with different people. Thanks, just a quick follow up on, on those. And thank you for that. I, I appreciate the, the response and some of which is in terms of the in the act kind of questions. Um, so I guess I'm thinking that when I talk about, uh, you know, ameliorating or mitigating, I was also thinking about, and I don't need a specific answer on these, but I, I'll just say, um, you know, it, is there any chance of a dump station on the west side? I mean, even if we do all of this, there's still going to be an issue. Um, can we, is there, is there some way to, um, or for, you know, provide a little bit of a carrot, <laughs> like a place you can do this and, um, you know, at a, at a reasonable rate um, along with the stick, um, things like, you know, I'm just thinking about as I hear you say that um, the the cost of, you know, towing, storing, you know, the, the cost, the logistics, and the kind of just the, the material impossibility of continuing to do it this way. Are there other, I mean, you know, and I don't know the level of repair of some of these RVs, but, you know, it's probably significant cost to get them moving. But, I mean, can we think about ways to get people moving so that they can move on their own, you know, move away, right? So um, out of the particular offsite. Um, so rather than towing and then having to figure out what to do with the junk, um, if it's something that is on its way, it could be mobile, you know, is there something the city could do? Um, and then I had one more, but I forgot. So I'll, I'll just leave those for a moment. So I think I'll have Director Butler just uh, deal with the, um the dumping portion, but if I can just uh, talk about the other half of it, yeah, our our full preference would be that people would, would come in compliance with the law so that we would not have to tow their vehicles. None of us want to tow vehicles, especially for a person who this is the last thing they have in life. Nobody wants to do that. But we do need, for the sake of the other half of our community, the majority of our community, we do need to have the ability to say, uh, this is not going to be okay. Some of these vehicles are beyond repair, that there is not even a working restroom in the motorhome, and so it goes into a bucket that gets put outside of the motorhome, and, and people run by that or walk by that, and that becomes difficult for those folks. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, we would love for people to comply. In fact, the Sheriff's Office uh, I learned today that, you know, complained that some of the people that we've been doing enforcement on have now gone out in the county's jurisdiction. 
Um, and so um, we don't want to play, you know, you know, push the putty somewhere else. We want to help people if we can, but at the same time, we do have a responsibility for our community to do what we can. Lou, did you want to address the other? Sure. Thanks, Chief Mills, and um, thank you, Councilmember Brown, for circling back to that because um, Chief Mills was talking about something right now, and one of the things that I heard in your question, your, your prior question, was um, some of the things that we're thinking about doing um, and that are kind of on the horizon. And so I appreciate the opportunity to speak to that a little bit. Um, one of them, of course, is what um, the council members included as part of their um, uh, their uh, ordinance language to um, have a expanded safe parking program and looking into that in and of itself. But I wanna talk about two other things. Um, one, the dump station. Um, and um, the, the first thing that I'd say related to that is that um, we have been looking at the potential for a dump station at 1220 River. Um, that does, that will uh, a, uh, a not insignificant cost um, of infrastructure. Um, there's also, we've also been looking at how that site may be utilized for other um, uh, homeless services. And so how those um, interact with each other, um, if there are, you know, large vehicles driving onto the site while we also have um, individuals who are potentially utilizing that site for other things. Uh, that uh, we haven't figured out exactly how that um, might uh, coordinate yet, but that is a, a consideration and that's a, a location where we have the property um, and it could feasibly um, be installed. So um, that's that's one option with some station, which um, the, the council members know, um, but I'll, I'll mention for the sake of the community, the nearest dump station is at the um, northeast corner of Soquel and um, Highway 1 at the 76 station. So it is, uh, you know, it's not super far, but it is, you know, a, a decent little ways away. Um, and um, second, um, you asked specifically about a, uh, a dump station on the west side. Um, I don't know that we have um, the, the property, I mean, maybe in the public right of way, um, you know, we don't own a uh, specific property, but there may be some option out there in the right of way. And that's certainly something that, that um, we could talk with Public Works about. I know Public Works has also been looking at um, updating the, um, the, the roadway design out there such that there's um, a protected bike lane on one side of the road. And so, uh, we'd have to look and see how all of that would uh, would fit in. If uh, I don't think a dump station was contemplated at the time, but I appreciate that suggestion that we can look into. The last thing that I'd want to mention in terms of some of the things that are proactive um, is actually just something that we were working on today, and it was in response to an email that went to the city council. Um, and um, uh, Council Member Brown, you were asking how we help people to to really move on to a better situation. And one of the things that um, we have as well as the county is a program called Homeward Bound. And if um, someone has um, a connection in uh, another location, but they don't have the means by which to get there, we can support that. And we verify that there is actually that, um, uh, that connection on the other end. But um, the, the council received an email, uh, or at least I received it yesterday. Um, I'm not exactly sure when the council received it, but, um, and it was someone asking, uh, you know, hey, I'm located somewhere else, but I, I don't have the gas money to get there. Can you help? And um, this person had also been coordinating with the county. Uh, we reached out with, to the county today, um, uh, connected with folks, and they had already offered the Homeward Bound program and connected them with the Homeward Bound program to assist them. So, so there are programs that we have in place to, um, to try and help people um, you know, uh, take that step up and that step forward. Thank you. Um, and just another follow-up on that, and then I have one last question, and then I'm, <laughs> um, I'm sure I'll have more, but for the moment. Um, so, with, and I'm familiar with the Homeward Bound program. Um, is that a program that, but I'm not familiar with all the details, um, where, for, so you met, but for example, registration, I know vehicle registration becomes, you know, the longer that you're not registered, the harder it is to kind of figure out what, how to, how to address it. 
Um, so is that something that can be, that people can get help with through Homeward Bound or do you know of any other other resource, I guess? Um, I'm just trying to think about ways to provide some safety net that is also, you know, facilitating uh, improvement, I, I guess. So um, just anything, just those kinds of things are, you know, I'd, I'd love to just keep talking about them, I guess. Um, I could, if I may jump in, um, that's all right. Um, uh, thank you for those questions, Council Member Brown. That That is something that we've been talking to some of the neighbor groups are very interested in supporting is um, doing fundraising and providing some funds for vehicle repairs, vehicle registration, um, support with uh, dumping vouchers, dumpster vouchers. So um, those have been discussed, nothing's been set in stone, but those are some ideas that the um, neighborhood groups of the faith community that we've been, faith com members of the faith community that we've been talking to are very interested in pursuing. Great, and um, I hope the city can um, help coordinate in whatever role um, to help support that. Uh, then the, I have a question and I just wanna make sure I'm getting this uh, correctly. The program recognizing that this is a you know, first shot and there's much conversation to be had uh, before, you know, and then the first reading and second reading. Is the, is, does the proposal, does that mean that so somebody who has an RV um, who wants to get a permit must can only get that permit if they have a residence that they can park it, that they that they have access to that they can park it in front of. So you have to say you have a residence in order to have the RV parking, which seems a little, um, I mean, I, the, the attempt to address a challenge, but it seems like it's, it's not really gonna, I guess I'm just trying to figure out how, how that fits in and, and will it, will, you know, will and who could take it, who could actually use that kind of program if, um, it were to be established. So, does that make sense? Am I right that you need a you need to have a physical address that has street parking in front of it, and that's the place you can park in order to get the permit? Is that correct? Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, looking forward to further conversation. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Cummings and then Council Member Watkins. Thank you, Vice Mayor Bruner. I just want to express my appreciation to my colleagues in the community for bringing this item to our attention. I know that many people on the west side have been concerned about impacts of RVs uh, that are problematic. And I think it's important that we hear uh, the concerns being raised and work together to find a constructive solution to specific problems. Um, I've worked at the Long Marine Lab at the end of Delaware since 2015, and so I see what's happening down there on a regular basis, and it's a very complicated and complex situation because while there are, uh, you know, problematic individuals that are down there in problematic circumstances, um, there's also people down there who have been responsible, who pick up trash after themselves that um, are not in this behavior, and so my hope is that, you know, as we move forward, we try to mitigate the negative, we try to mitigate the negative impacts while not penalizing people who are causing problems in our community because uh, as it becomes increasingly more expensive in Santa Cruz, I know a lot of people who are, you know, business owners and who contribute to our community who are shifting to living in vehicles because they just can't afford um, rents and they would prefer to invest, save money so they can, you know, eventually buy a home. So um, I guess the first question I have is that um, I, I do want to follow up on that question regarding the Coastal Commission because um, one of the things I noticed, and for those members of the public who aren't aware, there was an article in the Good Times this morning um, where it was, you know, brought to the attention that the appeal was um, to ban that was um, uh, rejecting the ban on the the previous ordinance uh, that was submitted was rejected 11 to 1 by the Coastal Commission. And you know, one of the things that's quoted in this article um, by um, one of the members of the Coastal Commission is that in the time since um, the, the, this vote was made, uh, they told the city that if they wanna come back, the commission to come back with evidence concerning two issues. One, what is the need for this restriction? And two, what is the plan on where people um, displaced are supposed to go? And so, you know, this has been with the Coastal Commission since 2016. 
And I'm just curious, you know, what we're doing right now is introducing an amended version of that same ordinance. And um, what I'm concerned with is just what is the likelihood that this isn't going to get appealed and we're going to be in the same process? Because I would imagine that, um, you know, if it passes, then it's going to have to go to the Coastal Commission, then it gets voted on by the Coastal Commission at some future meeting. If we haven't done anything since 2016, then we're just going to find ourselves in the same situation. So I'm just kind of curious um, what's been done to mitigate the impacts of or the issues that were raised in 2016 and how is this any different from what we submitted previously? Can the city attorney respond to that? Yeah, I can respond to it. I think, um, first of all, I think the article, while I didn't read that, um, is an accurate uh, summary of what occurred at the Coastal Commission in August of 2016. Um, I think the effort that has been made by the, the group that's been working on this ordinance is to be prepared to get appealed to the Coastal Commission um, and, and to be prepared to answer that question. The, the language of the ordinance specifically contemplates um, a safe parking program being implemented and other measures uh, so that when the question is asked, um, there's a good answer. And there really wasn't a good answer uh, when the matter was presented to the Coastal Commission in um, 2016. I might add that the issue before the Coastal Commission was whether to find that there was significant enough issue that the Coastal Commission wanted to hear the appeal on its merits. So the Coastal Commission made a uh, substantial issue finding didn't necessarily um, reject the ordinance, but it did um, signal that it was going to take a very careful look at it and and probably would have um, not ultimately certified it. So we need to have a better answer when we talk to the Coastal Commission this go round. Okay. I guess one concern I do have along those lines is I met with some of the AFC members a few weeks back, and one of the individuals was um, – was operating um, the state parking program. And one of the comments that was made was that in our conversation was that, um, you know, they, there are capacity issues in terms of having people who can staff some of these sites. And I know that the state parking program that was located in the lot over by Wheelworks um, and by the uh, arena, that was taken offline because they were just having so many issues with that lot. So one thing for me that's kind of concerning is just, you know, are we going to be able to find enough people in the community want to help like monitor and run these programs? And Chief, I'm not sure if you can maybe comment. Is the program at the PD still up and running in terms of the safe parking program? Uh, they have not been here for a while. Okay. I have not seen them uh, at least in our front line. Okay. So like, that's, that's just one concern is, you know, how we can increase that. Um, I did want to ask about enforcement. Uh, I know that this is, you know, there's two aspects of this. There's a, you know, criminal issue if people are, you know, committing crimes who are living in these vehicles, similar to if somebody's committing a crime who lives in a house um, and police responding to those calls. But then in terms of enforcement of this particular ordinance, since this is kind of a parking issue, is this something we would expect police to be responding to or would there be, you know, traffic um, similar to other permit programs that we have in town? Is this kind of a traffic enforcement issue. And I know that um, I tried reaching out to uh, Mark Dettel, Public Works Director, before this, but he's out of town, and so I got an away message. So I just figured I'd, I'd ask at this point in time. Uh, Council Member Cummings, I think it, it traditionally falls on our shoulders uh, to do this. However, there are other entities in the city who are capable of writing parking citations. Um, as well as code enforcement uh, stuff. So uh, parking could, uh, if they so choose, uh, to go out and do these kinds of enforcement uh, where there's parking uh, involved. The misdemeanor portions of the ordinance would need to be done by the police. Uh, but just straight parking uh, enforcement can be done by parking. Uh, the parking enforcement is a completely different division of the uh, of the of the of the city. Great. And then, um, you know, there's a large part of this ordinance speaks to people who are homeowners who have RVs, so residents in town who have RVs. 
And I'm just curious if that's been a problem, like how, to what extent has that been a problem to where we're needing to include that in this ordinance? Because, um, you know, one of the things that I'm concerned with is that this isn't to our specific to RVs, it's oversized, it's any vehicle that's over the, over 20 feet, right? And so that also includes work vehicles, um, that also includes fans. And the one issue for me in particular is that there, you know, and it's an issue on equity, not everybody in the city of Santa Cruz has a driveway. And so there are neighborhoods where the only street is on street parking. And if somebody has a vehicle that falls outside of this, you know, that's greater than 20 feet, they can't necessarily park the vehicle on their street for more than four days, right? Um, so I'm wondering, has that, you know, I guess the question is, has the issue of people who are residents owning large vehicles been, uh, you know, an issue to the point where we need to create a law to enforce against them having these vehicles? Um, I can tell you that from just getting complaints from community members that yes, it can be a problem. Um, it's not uncommon for us. I remember one not too long ago in the Grant Street neighborhood where a person had a large bus and kept it in front of their house for an extended period of time. I think they've been ready to go on vacation, but it had there for a great deal of time. And so several neighbors were upset about it. And then we wound up tagging the bus and they moved it. And so it became a, a move the bus game. Uh, and so, yeah, that is just one anecdotal uh, story, but it's not uncommon for us to to get those kind of uh, issues. We also uh, businesses that uh, that park semi trucks, uh, both attached and unattached trailers on the street as well, and uh, so it it can be a problem. Great. Um, I've only got three more questions, and hopefully they're quick. Um, one, I guess. Um, so I was I noticed when the the West Side Story operation happened, and we did see, you know, um, vehicles that I guess were problematic were, were towed. Some were left that I guess weren't problematic. Um, and, you know, in part, that seems like it could be, you know, an approach we're taking where we're not penalizing those people who are complying. And, you know, ideally, we would be trying to give people every opportunity possible to fix their vehicle or, you know, um, Bring their vehicle up to code, and if they're not, you know, if they're not in violation of any other law. But um, my question is, when when those people are approached, what kind of resources are being offered to them? Because um, I think the thing that we don't want to see happening is that you know people have shelter, that shelter is now taken away, and then now they're put on the sh on the street in Santa Cruz. Um, versus also, if they have an opportunity to leave, you know, that they could have that as an option. So I'm just wondering if you can speak to that. Yeah, I sure can. Thank you for bringing that up because uh, I really feel like our officers uh, use a great deal of discretion uh, when they're towing these vehicles. Uh, I can give you a couple of examples. Um, two families that were living out there uh, in their motor home with small children, and we did not tow those vehicles. Uh, we asked them to get their parking tickets taken care of. Uh, we asked them to you know, move to a different location, but we did not tow those vehicles. Uh, it made no sense for us to put a child on the street. And uh, and so our officers do approach this with a great deal of compassion. I, I saw a social media story that a, uh, a person in was uh, displaced and put on the street who was handicapped. And I asked the officers about that, and their response was, no, he had someone to go home with. He was a local person who had a place to go to uh, when, they, when they towed that car. Um, the reality is uh, some of these vehicles have had dozens of citations. Uh, they know uh, that they're far out of compliance. Uh, this wasn't a uh, five citations and on the 22nd day when we can lawfully tow it, we towed it. This has been an ongoing thing. And I can tell you that also that our officers are pretty uh, diligent about making sure that people understand that there are other options available, whether it's handing out an AFC flyer uh, or um, asking them to move. Uh, I have been out there, talked to people, asked them to move, asked them to go somewhere else, and uh, because this doesn't make sense to inundate a neighborhood like that. So our, I think our officers do a pretty darn good job at that. Second piece, and I want to comment, is I think the county has also been out there talking to, with people as well. And so um, I don't know that this, you know, we do it because 
we believe it's the humane and correct thing to do, but I don't see this as a sole police responsibility uh, to um, uh, to help people get into homes. Because there's been some recent research that showed that uh, people aren't really will willing to listen to the police about those kinds of things. And so I'd much rather have other people do that. But when you're the only game in town, uh, sometimes you do things just because uh, it's a necessity. Uh, so I, I think that you know, we want to make sure that people have that option uh, to get it fixed, to leave, to do something else rather than stay uh, there uh, in a broken down state. And then I, I just have one more question. Um, and this is for Public Works, and I know the Public Works director's not around, so I hope someone might be available, or maybe um, this can go to anyone of uh, staff who's been kind of involved in this, but, um, you know, we've discussed different types of parking permit programs before, and I'm just curious in understanding what resources it will take to stand up this kind of a program in terms of, um, you know, because we're going to need to process applications for a variety of different types of permits, obviously, because you have the residential, you have visitor, um, and so I'm just wondering, you know, what, are, what types of resources is it going to take to create this program, stand it up, and the timeline around that. We have uh, Nathan Ewan, who is filling in for Director Dettel uh, from Public Works, and Brian Borg here. So um, if either of you would be able to answer that question. Yeah, Justin, I think it's a, it's a very good question. I think there's still some implementation cost uh, modeling that we need to do, but in, in part, we're already kind of established to be able to handle permit programs based on all of our other permit programs that we have. You know, we have a pretty significant residential parking permit program already, um, you know, outside of the Coastal Commission and on the east side, we have another pretty big one that's been growing. So under those programs, we already handle a lot of process applications, you know, residential verifications. Um, I don't think that this is going to add or grow um, to the point where it, it's causing too much more burden than what we've already created with those existing programs. Um, and we already have those staffed. And as you know, like September, right now we're going through, you know, the West Side program on September 15th, and we have a number of people inundating that office, and that office is busy. Um, the nice thing about this annual program is I think it'll trickle into demand. It won't be all at once. And so I think it'll kind of just roll into our normal processes. Um, you know, renewals will happen as people need it as opposed to, you know, a start date for a program to start. Um, but we probably, you know, we'll have to make sure that we, all the, all the costing related to issuing the permits, printing permits, if we have to print them or get stickers or hang tags, um, or if we need any additional staff to help with processing, um, you know, those, there will be added cost to rolling this into that. But, you know, we already, you know, process a significant amount. Thank you. Um, I'll, that concludes my questions for now, and uh, I have a few comments after um, we hear from the public. Thank you. Council Member Watkins. Uh, thank you, Vice Mayor, and I will keep my questions short, and um, I know we haven't gone to the, to the public yet. I, I think a lot of my questions have been answered. Um, I guess I just make a couple short comments, and then I have one one question in, in regards to process. Um, so, as I read it, that this you know, since the first ordinance was passed or uh, attempted, um, a number of other jurisdictions have adopted ordinances that have moved forward, and so I think we are definitely in a different place. So, um, I just sort of want to highlight that in regards to sort of some of the areas where we did have challenges in the past, um, there's a lot to have been learned in between now and then. Um, I did understand that the AFC is one uh, service provider, but also just really working with the county and others as we move forward. Um, and and I, I guess what I'll just sort of, I guess what I'll say is, um, I just want to, I just really appreciate my colleagues for bringing this forward and for the work that you did on this. I think that as um, difficult as it is to balance all of the considerations that are before us, environmental and residential and visitors and neighbors and income um, brackets and areas and all the impacts, right? I think we have something that's not working right now and we want to move forward with something that's better. And it will be 
more, but we continue to move forward in a way that's trying to move us in a way that's balancing all of those needs. And I know, Chief, you brought that up in terms of balance. So I just sort of want to highlight that because I know there are elements that I think we can really get into the weeds in to tonight or you know forthcoming, but having that kind of approach around continuous improvement, but ultimately recognizing that what we have right now and in action and working. And, and frankly, I will just say just being um, participating in the coastal cleanup events that took place over the weekend. On Saturday, I had Delaware Natural Bridges and Schaefer and, um, and it, it, is, it is not okay to see the amount of trash and litter and environmental impacts, nor the living conditions and the impacts that has on the individuals who are residing in those vehicles, as well as the neighbors and visitors. So I um, I recognize the challenges before us, and I also am committed to action and moving forward. Um, so in regards to my question, I think since the majority have been asked, and um, I know a lot of community members are waiting to also ask questions, I guess mine is in regards to process. So what's different from what was presented was that this is not a first reading, that this is an introduction of a concept, ultimately to have a first reading come back. So I guess if I can, are my colleagues hoping that we as council members, as well as community members, um, really kind of take the moment to absorb what was being proposed and then to use this time between now and the first reading to ask those questions for clarity to then be informed for how the first reading will go forward. Is that sort of the process tonight that we're proposing or that you're all proposing at this point? Yes, correct. Okay. Okay, great. So in, in that way, so I appreciate that. That gives me more time to kind of think and also to incorporate some of the questions that have been brought up by community members um, and we can move forward in terms of how we want to hear input um, this evening. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Council Member Watkins. You actually touched on the points I was going to bring up that, so I'll keep it short, but that this is not the same ordinance. Um, it looks different. Um, we have the red line version in the packet, but you can see where those changes are. Um, and it's working simultaneously with the community on um, alternative, um, alternative options. And there's quantitative data now that um, isn't just anecdotal. Um, so I just, I'll, I just wanted to reiterate those points. Thank you. Thank you. As there are no further questions from council, we will take it out for public comment and then return to council. Um, let's see, I, my understanding is we will do the groups first uh, and there is a specific order. Um, so if anybody has their hands raised right now, if you could put them down unless you are a group. And we will um, start with the groups in the following order, Westside Cares, West Side Neighbors, and then Stepping Up Santa Cruz. Is that correct, Bonnie? Yes, yeah, that's right. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, West Side Care, um, I see you there. If you could press star six on your phone and your time will start. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. So I'm calling on behalf of Santa Cruz Cares, which is formerly known as Westside Cares, just for clarification, to ask that you use an ordinance that is specifically designed to push the poor into unsheltered homelessness. We've been watching in horror as the Santa Cruz Police Department gleefully tickets and tows vehicles as part of their Operation West Side Story. These operations have left, left at least one elderly disabled person without any shelter at all who had to rely on people to share his story on social media. Just a note, Andy Mills, you're correct. He did not have a place to go. We did not see the city stepping in to help this neighbor. You have chosen to tow, ticket, and hand out misdemeanors to people who are financially unable to comply with this policy, directly creating more unsheltered homelessness. At the same time, the shelters around the city have been closing and agreement camps have been swept. The largest camp at the Benchlands is under threat by the city and also by the flood risk of the San Lorenzo. The city is failing our unhoused neighbors on just about every level, even without this new ordinance, which will surely make matters worse. We ask the city council to sponsor programs such as refuse pickup, gray water disposal, and vehicle registration clinics. We ask that you create true low barrier safe parking programs. This is sorely needed now. 
a moral failing and we need to stop punishing people for it. We also believe that parts of this ordinance are violations of civil liberties for both the sheltered and unsheltered. Restricting households to one oversized vehicle parked 400 feet from their registered property is absurd. This also directly violates recommendations from the Coastal Commission on previous iterations of this ordinance. These policies are directly going to create more unsheltered homeless. We've already seen the results of policies like this one in our own community in California at large. We don't believe that anyone calling in tonight or anyone on the city council actually wants that. Please do the right thing and think about these unsheltered people. They're living in poverty and these fines and fees are not helping them. Sonia, you're muted. Or Vice Mayor Brown, you're muted. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Santa Cruz Cares. Thank you. Um, and now, next up, we have West Side Neighbors. Is that uh, Rafa? Are you representing West Side Neighbors? Are you stand up. No. Right now, is there anyone from West Side Neighbors? Is that MP? Press star six. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, th hi there, are you with Santa Cruz, uh, West Side Neighbors? Yes, I am, my name is Manuel. I'm a local resident. I live uh, on the West Side. I'm a uh, property uh, owner. I own a business, my father and husband. And I gotta say that this problem, as the previous city council member mentioned, is really getting out of control. We have a very small, number of residents in this town in their RVs that are making life very difficult. As a father, um, it's difficult to hear my children say that they're afraid of walking down the street. The environment is obviously being impacted. We've got rats all across Natural Bridges State Park, which certainly has an impact on the monarch butterflies there. And I applaud the city council trying to do something about this, but it's it's really late. Uh, it's, as, as Chief Mills mentioned, 20 years have gone by and nothing has happened here. It's not fair that the people that, 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 that the, the ones that really cannot vote, the children or the animals, are being so disproportionately affected by this. I encourage you all to do something about this. I think ordinance is a step in the right direction. I'll also state that we absolutely need enforcement. There are laws in the books today. We need those to be enforced so that it's safe for everyone. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, the next is Stepping Up Santa Cruz. Um, go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Hi, this is Serge. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Hi, Serge. Good evening. Uh, nothing in what I'm about to say okays littering or sewage dumping. Those things are already illegal. There are more effective and more common sense ways to solve these issues. Ordinance. Sewage is stated as the biggest problem. As uh, Lee referred to, uh, the CATS recommended a free sewage dump site at 1220 River Street but why is that not being instituted before we're criminalizing poverty? It's clearly not constitutional to cite a vehicle dweller for litter that is near them without proof that they are the cause, yet that is specifically included in the ordinance. If car registration is the issue, why are people not being connected to the churches like Holy Cross, which help pay for that before their home is taken? This proposed ordinance will not stand a legal challenge with the Coastal Commission because it's blocking access to the coastal zone, making some people not welcome to live in or move to Santa Cruz. This, the ordinance says the city may, but does not require it to have safe parking programs. Shelters and safe spaces do not need people forced into their programs. They're already full most of the time. It's not true, to, it's not helpful to recommend that somebody calls AFC when they're always full. We'll never have enough space in our programs. So we'll have the same problems without any new solutions. This ordinance accedes to the demands of only one constituency. The health in all policy section doesn't even refer to the health of those people who are gonna be forced into unsheltered homes. 
Multiple studies show that minorities are inordinately affected by these type of ordinances, making obtaining housing and employment more difficult or impossible. Studies show that criminalization of those living in vehicles causes those people onto the to be moved onto the streets, experiencing more trauma, worse, worse health conditions, and a lower life expectancy. It's stated in the last agenda item that water is our more, most important resource. I'd say that people should be considered our most important resource. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, that concludes the group. And so now we will move on to further public comment. Uh, to raise your hand, press star nine. When it's your time to speak, you will be called on and you'll press star six to unmute yourself. So now I will go out to public comment, attendees. Rafa, please uh, press star six to unmute yourself. Thank you very much. Um, I'm calling on behalf of Santa Cruz EMB this evening to express some concerns with the approach that the ordinance, uh, uh, for the ordinance that the city seems to be moving towards. First though, I appreciate the city for committing to expanding options for unhoused folks who live in their vehicles to have a legal safe space to park the vehicle. Uh, we're not necessarily against a permit program, but we are concerned that as proposed, the program could leave the most vulnerable members of our community without a legal option to park their vehicle. The requirement to have had a vehicle registered in the city for six months in order to establish residency seems particularly problematic and is likely unconstitutional since that same requirement does not apply to house residents who would want a permit for their oversized vehicles. Our existing safe spaces program requires vehicles to have current registration and there were recently a significant number of vehicles towed for having expired registrations. Under the proposed scheme, those vehicles would not be allowed either in the safe spaces program or on public streets. But those people exist and their needs need to be taken into account too. If we cite and tow, we'll be taking away the meager shelter that they have, exacerbating our shortage of shelter beds. Uh, we should be focusing on problems that lift people, on solutions that lift people up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, Father Joseph Jacobs, press star six to unmute yourself. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I appreciate that. So I am the program manager for the Association of Faith Community Safe Spaces Parking Program. I want to be clear about one thing to begin with, that Safe Spaces is not a city-sponsored program. The city has never sponsored Safe Spaces and has never given any funding for it. So I'm gonna plead with people to stop referring to it in that manner. Um, we had, plans to submit a request for qualifications to the city for an expanded safe parking program to address this problem. And we were told that there is, quote, not one cent, end quote, available for funding such a program and that the city will use its $14 billion to purchase the land or matters to create a day center. So I'm really unclear where the funding for um, expanding the safe parking program is coming from. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, I have Reggie Meisler, press star six. Do you want to mute yourself, please? Hi. Um, so I've heard a lot about expansion of safe parking programs and connecting people to housing. Um, but looking over your proposal, all I really see fleshed out is the criminalization piece. And now that we've heard from AFC that uh, funding around this proposal for the safe parking doesn't really seem there and has never really been there. I mean, I, I really feel like I have to question the authenticity of this proposal. Your presenter is not a member of Health and Human Services. It's not a social worker. It's not a service provider. I mean, it's the chief of law enforcement. So we can talk a lot about services and housing support, but it, I mean, the focus that you're having speaks louder than the sort of flowery words thrown here and there. And then in Chief Mills' presentation, <clears throat> he's telling us that he has so much extra money and land, it's unaccounted for. Um, and he's just, spending it 
on towing people and taking their shelter away? Thank you. I don't see. Okay, the next number is ending in 4931. Press star six to unmute yourself. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, so you all talk a lot about health and policies, yet you continue to write and pass policies that are both terrible for public health and not based on any sort of public health policy. As a result of SCPD's Operation West Side Story, multiple people lost their only shelter and their only belongings were towed away, which included medications and disability aids. They're unable to retrieve them because they cannot afford to. We'll codify this behavior into law and because of the nature of policing, we know that this will disproportionately affect people of color, gender nonconforming people, disabled people, and other marginalized groups. And before you all pontificate about how you believe doing nothing isn't compassionate and we must do something, criminalizing poverty, what you're suggesting, let me reify that no one is asking you to do nothing. We are demanding solutions that actually address the issues the community has. Refuse pick up great well, fixing and registering RVs. Your ordinance finds people for not having enough money to access resources. It does not help people get access to resources and thus it is not public health. Public health is helping those who need the most help to live the best lives that they can. To pass this ordinance in the name of public health or compassion is a farce. So at least be honest and visit the ordinance. Nothing more than punishment is a banishment of poor people from our streets. Vice Mayor, you're muted. Next up, I have Graham. Press star six to unmute yourself, please. Thank you for your chance. Okay. Yes. Great. Thank you for the chance to speak today. My name is Dr. Graham Press, and I work for the UCSF Standing Off Homelessness and Housing Initiative at the Center for Vulnerable Populations, and have conducted research for the past decade with vehicle residents in public parking and safe parking programs in cities like Seattle, San Francisco, and Oakland. I'll speak quickly uh, today to keep my comments to under one minute, but I'm happy to speak with you further and assist however possible. As Chief notes, Council Members Brown, uh, Cummings, and uh, previous public comments have explained the primary concerns regarding oversized vehicles lack of accessible off-street space for vehicle residents to inhabit their home, drain sewage, and dispose household waste. However, this ordinance cannot balance compassion with accountability because, approximately, because the approximately 30 uh, off-street space is currently available is not adequate space for around 300 vehicle residents in Santa Cruz County. Instead, this proposal exposes the city of Santa Cruz and its most vulnerable citizens to undue harm by uniquely mandating the residents of oversized vehicles apply for permits to hours for only four times per month, with no clear process to provide adequate off-street space for these constituents. If accepted by the California Coastal Commission, this proposal, proposed ordinance contradicts the 9th District Martin versus Boise decision, and uh, it, like other Thank cities, you. similar policies will likely trigger a lawsuit. Thank you. Um, next up, we have phone number ending in 4844, press star six to unmute yourself, please. We just heard you. Try again. Press star six to unmute yourself. There you go. Are you there? We can, I can hear you unmuting. one more time if not we can come back to you press star six on your device to unmute yourself phone number ending in four eight four four hello can you hear me yes oh okay hello uh hello Officials have no problem creating squalid and wretched conditions. This law empowers the police to harass, side and tow emergency survival housing, so-called oversized vehicles. Who cares about their welfare? Not this council. But they would have enacted 
Is disposal systems, as mentioned by others, assistance for disabled vehicles, and other obvious measures. Instead, a dis new displacements and restrictions designed to tease out a burp of satisfaction from the well-fed bellies of West Side property owners. The state eviction moratorium ends at the end of this month. The city moves on the homeless encampments like the bench lands. What can we do? See someone being harassed by Mills Ticket Squad? Stop, witness, and Time to choose. Act, watch, or turn away. Don't wait until it's your turn. Thank you. Next up, I have phone number ending in 8346. Press star six to unmute. As a mother and former teacher of underserved youth, I am convinced that the best way to teach empathy and the importance of building a just and equitable society is to model it. What are we teaching our youth when we criminalize people living in abject poverty, when we continue to make uninformed judgments and sweeping fear-based generalizations about people who may suffer from mental illness, drug addiction, cycles of oppression, or just a lack of city-supported resources? What are we teaching our kids when the SCPD makes an aggressive and boastful public display of destroying a person's due to out of reach unpaid parking and registration fees that they were never offered to help pay for in the first place? What then do we tell our children and students when they ask where these human beings left with no shelter and no possessions will go now? Do we lie and say there are beds and housing available when we know full well there aren't nearly enough? that the cops are heroes and the poor are criminals simply for trying to the confines of their given condition. This is a decades long failure of empathy, a failure to see past comfort and privilege, a failure to get educated on the complexities of poverty and survival behaviors, defund the police, invest in a community of care and oppose the oversized vehicle ordinance. Thank you. Next up, I have Number ending in 0249, press star six, please, to unmute yourself. Hello, Hi there. Um, City Council. Oops, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, this is Carol, thank you. First of all, I wanna say thank you for all your hard work on a long time coming, and I know it's a very difficult issue to tackle with a lot of moving parts. Robert North said it best, allowing people to live on the street in, in squalor and wretched conditions is horrible. It's not compassionate. People who are living on our streets, especially on the Lower West Side, receive no services. They get the um, disdain of the local residents who are tired of the multiple impacts that, that they've experienced from having people live on the street without services. We need to provide help for people. It's not the end game to allow people to live like this forever. We have to provide places for people to go where there are services available to them to help them to get out of their situation and to improve their lot in life. I applaud the city council for looking into the resources available to help us make more parking available for people who need it and to help clean up the situation that exists in our neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next I have phone number ending in 2174. Press star six to unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, first of all, a big appreciation to the vice mayor for point saying press star six. I can't tell you what a difference that makes when you're on this end. My name is Gillian Greensight, and I wasn't going to call in and speak. I haven't read the ordinance. I'm well aware of the issues. Uh, but I heard a couple of comments that I felt I'd like to respond to. One is that this has been going on for 20 years. Well, since COVID, my, uh, myself and a few friends, we walk before we swim at Cowles. So instead of Westcliff, uh, we've been doing the distancing and everything at the Marine Lab. And so Delaware is where we park or bicycle. And I can assure you, that for the past year, this has not been um, a big problem, but it has escalated in the past, I'd say, two to three months, escalated. This week, it is obviously getting worse. I wish the opponents who talk in generalities, and I understand their sympathies, but I wish that they could get involved in... Oh, that went quickly. Okay, I had quite a bit more, but thank you for your time. 
Thank you. Next up, I have Joy. Please press star six to unmute. Hi, this is Joy Schendeldecker. I am a parent and homeowner on the west side. I'm also an organizer with some local groups, including Sanitation for the People. And I think it's really interesting presentation was paired with the water presentation just before it, which I imagine a lot of people didn't listen carefully to. It talked a lot about Prop 218 from 1996, which has basically taken water, sewer, and refuse services out of the public common good and made them private enterprise funds um, that are only available to ratepayers or people who have property to live in. So if you don't have property, you don't get services. We can, as a community, decide to instead of having a competitive-driven approach, have um, an ethical community approach, and we can figure out how to pay for more of the services instead of criminalizing people. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I have JB. Please press star six to unmute. Hi, as a Santa Cruz resident, I'm strongly in favor of amending Title 10. Santa Cruz's homeless problem is, as it currently stands is unacceptable. It is a humanitarian problem, it is an environmental problem, and it is getting worse over time. One of the big drivers of this problem is a collective refusal to enact and enforce reasonable traffic and parking laws, especially when it comes to RVs. The lack of political will to prohibit and enforce overnight RV parking is not compassionate towards the mentally ill and drug addicted that inhabit these quote unquote dwellings. It is certainly not compassionate towards Santa Cruz taxpayers and residents. It is destroying our community, it is destroying our environment, it is disincentivizing the most vulnerable among us to change their lives for the better and get help. I urge you to amend Title 10. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have phone number ending in 0135. Please press star six to unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, my name is Mike Polhamus. I'm a lifelong Santa Cruz resident and high school teacher. Um, I've heard a lot tonight about the ethics and the one uh, solution or another. The main issue here, as I see it, is the ability to pay for services who, for, for people who cannot pay for themselves. And the opportunity to place a sales tax at the ballot could have been used for this purpose. However, obviously that's not an option anymore, but the bottom line is that if you don't have money to pay for services such as acquiring property and being able to provide said services, none of this is ever going to change. I encourage the city council to revisit the sales tax issue, put it on the ballot and let the people vote on it so that at least at some point in time in the future, we can have the funds with a city that is essentially insolvent to buy property and to create safe pro parking programs and other types of services for people who cannot help themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, I have Alicia Cool, star six, to unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. So I just wanted to kind of echo um, that many of these things that are being discussed. Um, like dumping of sewage and things like that are crimes. Um, the Homeless Union has never supported crimes and we've always thought that those things can be mitigated um, with proper use of the police department rather than criminalizing people in general. Um, when you take away people's RVs or excessively fine them to try to take away their RVs, what you're doing is you're putting more people you know, in San Lorenzo Park. And unfortunately, that's a problem for our entire community. So I would really urge you um, to focus on safe parking programs and safe parking programs that include everyone, not ones that with limited capacity ran by just one person, because that's really high barrier for most people. And I just wanna be very clear that if this does pass, litigation will follow. I'm the one that works on that. So I wanna just clear that up for the entire community, but that's not in question here. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I have 
let's see, Jasmine, uh, press star six to unmute. Hello, um, my name's Jasmine, and um, I rent in the West Side. Um, but I've been hearing a lot of, you know, talk about disrupting the monarch or something. And, you know, a lot of, like, words with D, disrupt the monarch, what are fellow humans? Or it's difficult for people to walk by people in RVs. What about the fact that they're in desperate conditions often or don't have any other options? And houseless people are more often victims of crime than perpetrators. I haven't heard of houseless people, you know, hurting children, you know, for the person who said they're worried about their children. I think it's more uncomfortable, and that's what people don't want to face. Also, this idea of leaning on the AFC for safe parking when it's funded doesn't make any sense and stop passing the buck to county. Um, we need to find alternatives and safe sleeping solutions first. Don't displace or criminalize desperate people. And I agree with the other caller. We should just defund the police and reallocate these funds to programs like this that can actually support health and human services. What this is right now is not compassionate and it is not humane. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is phone number ending in 9248. Press star six to unmute yourself. Yeah, I want to thank everybody involved for the attempt. The attempt is with honor. And it's time that we as Americans and Santa Cruzans recognize this. And I think in particular, Chief Mills, uh, and um, uh, Mr. Condotti uh, and Lee Butler, and I think probably previously uh, um, uh, Mr. Bernal, uh, for pushing this to the point where it becomes an issue that can be uh, litigated uh, and legislated. And, and there's deep honor in that, uh, and it's, it's what needs to be done. I want to say thank you to all and pass this. It's an attempt that has honor and is dignified. And it's something that we need to do. It'll help us to push the issue into the consciousness of people, that we can deal with poverty in the way that we haven't, maybe since the 1930s. Thank you. And thank you, City Council, for um, this issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, it looks like that concludes our public comment. Oh, we have a couple more hands that went up. So um, go ahead, uh, Abby, press star six to unmute yourself. Okay, I live on the wet, lower west side within a mile of Delaware. I visit it often and speak to the residents who live in the vehicles there. I was there when the police did West Side Story, in which he towed many vehicles. I was there when they were going to tow the oversized vehicle that had a 12-year-old child their mother and their grand grandmother who resided in it. You had all the intentions to tow that vehicle that had been begged and pleaded with the officer in charge at the time to not tow them that they had a 12 year old inside. That officer said it was too late and there was nothing they could do once they called the tow company. I put up a protest and luckily Sergeant Burrow decided to override the choice of the officer in charge of towing vehicles. Believe me, if I wasn't there, that vehicle would have been towed. So please don't stop using that as an example of you having compassion. So many lies you have mentioned, such as a disabled person had to, a place to go, that they had no intention of towing the RV with a 12-year-old, and that AFC sponsored program. Thanks to Father Joseph, who called in. Um, most of you know that many people are turned away from AFC. You're just pushing out people out into the street. I know you know that this is not a matter of compassion. Stop criminalizing the houseless. Thank you, Abby. Next, I the phone number ending in 0711. Press star six to unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Hi, thank you. My name is Sophia Alarcon. I am a resident of Santa Cruz, and um, I currently reside in Live Oak. Um, I am also formerly houseless, and I was form hom formerly houseless in Santa Cruz County um, in my vehicle. So I have some experience in that area. 
Um, and the main thing I want to say, because I don't have that much time, is that treating the houseless like everybody else should be the priority. And that means funding for these programs that we're talking about, um, these safe parking programs. But mostly it also means providing actual housing units and services for dignity um, of these this human talking about. Um, and it sounds like we the staffing isn't really an issue um, for some of these programs. So I'm kind of curious what were the other issues with the some of the previous things. Anyways, um, I think one of the other things that stood out to me about a lot of things that people said was low barriers. So um, right here we're creating barriers. So you don't want to tow people, but you or, but you want to keep at them. There's just a lot to say, but anyways, thank you. Vice Mayor, you're muted. Thank you, Bonnie. <laughs> it looks like that concludes our public comment. Um, no more hands are up, so I will pull it back uh, to Council, and it looks like uh, Council Member Golder and Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Golder, you uh, go ahead. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you to the public who called in. Um, I'm prepared to make a motion, and I've emailed it to Bonnie. And there's two parts of the motion. One um, is to continue the item to the meeting of October 26th to allow for the consideration of public comments on the draft ordinance and allow time to prepare um, associated updates with ordinance language and to direct staff in cooperation with an ad hoc uh, subcommittee to be appointed by the mayor to establish a sub the subcommittee um, now and they can begin exploring what a safe parking program can or should include should one be established as part um, or outside of any future ordinance. Okay, we have a motion. Is there a second? Council Member Kalantari Johnson, your hands up. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'll second that. And um, I just want to add um, just a couple comments. Um, just as, pa as part of number two, I don't know if we need a friendly amendment, but that, that just to clarify that there have been a group of us working on this. So it's, it's really a continuation um, of this work and, a, and um, just to formalize a continuation of this work. So just some comments. I also want to thank the community members who took the time to call in this evening. Um, you know, some of the lessons learned with, with our work with the camping ordinance was that we really um, take the time and space, um, even though this has been in the works for a long time, for years by, by very members to take the time um, and space to hear from community members, receive input, and bring forward an ordinance that um, is a compromise space. Um, not everybody will be happy, and, and that's, that's the case when we come to complex and challenging issues like this. Um, you know, somebody, somebody said um, that we, we move forward with law enforcement and not health and human services. So I just want to remind um, the public and remind us that we, the city does not have a health and human services. We don't have a department. We don't have a team. It's um, out of the scope of the city to provide those types of services. And um, we know this can't be done in a vacuum. So um, our, our um, approach is as Chief Mills said, to find that balance of accountability and compassion. And I know people are defining it different ways, um, but I do believe that action is compassion because we can get sucked into a loop of finding the flaw. We can get sucked into a loop of not good enough. Um, and those narratives um, have doomed our community and, provide, and, and made us polarized and divided. Um, or we can put one foot in front of the other and launch and formalize a response that will continue to evolve. Um, so that's what I'm interested in doing here. Um, there's part, there, there are groups out there who are interested in partnering, um, expanding with now, and um, yeah, so I'll just, I'll just pause there. Thank you. Thank you. I have Council Member Cummings and then Council Member Brown. 
Um, first off, can we keep the ordinance language up? I'm wondering how we can um, second go back up. I mean, I have comments to make, and then I, I can I can make comments on this, and then we can take it down, or I can um, make my comments. But either way, um, one before I have my comments to make on the general discussion that we've been having, I do want to point out that. Um, if we want to, if the council or the subcommittee wants to put an item back on the agenda for October 26th, like two weeks for public comp for, you know, community input. And then I would imagine that staff would need time to write the agenda report, which technically would need to be submitted by October 14th, although there is some flexibility around when those get submitted. Um, so that, that is one concern I have is that, um, you know, when we deal with issues on homelessness, like these are very complicated issues and very sensitive topics. And, you know, when it comes to laws that are gonna impact members of our community, I think it's really important that, um, you, that we give ourselves time to really get um, the level of community input necessary to, to know that when we're putting this forward, that we're putting something forward that has had the broadest amount of input um, and that, um, you know, the broad majority of the community feels comfortable moving forward with. Uh, we, you know, we yet something about this issue, um, but what I've found being on the council is that you know, people really want to be included in these conversations. We saw that with the TOLO, and this for many people is the first time they're seeing this item come before us. So I would um, encourage that that be extended and um, that friendly amendment can be um, that this item is continued the subcommittee, um, you know, deems it's okay for it to come back, or that there is, you know, no date um, with, you know, when this can come back. I mean, it's clear that this is something that um, the, our current vice mayor is working on and is supporting. And if this needs to go into next year when the vice mayor is then the mayor, we know that there's an opportunity for her to put this on the agenda. But I think what we really need to do is to ensure that there is a diverse and inclusive community process that really provides enough time for people to weigh in. And we're all really busy people. I mean, I don't see, you know, regardless of who's on this council, that'd be a lot of, you know, put, setting aside our, our time to, you know, if we really want to have an inclusive process. So what I think is that we extend that timeline out further so that people aren't just really rushing to get everything in, that we're giving the community enough time to digest this ordinance and get their feedback to uh, the members of the subcommittee and to the council. Um, and then I do, I would, I just want item number two, um, should, because this is mentioning, um, you know, explore the establishment of safe parking programs. It should one be established as part of, um, as part of or outside any future ordinance. The one issue I really want to bring up, and this is, I'll just kind of get into my comments right now. Um, I have a really big issue with the discharge of sewage because as it's currently written, and to see if um, somebody from staff could, could comment on this before I get into my comment. What is the current law on discharge of sewage? Because it, my understanding is that a law is already on the books and this isn't something we need to rewrite because um, I'm really concerned with what's before us today in terms of the language. And so somebody could comment on what that specific law is right now. I can do that. I've got the um, current section open here. Um, Bonnie, are you sharing your screen? I can share mine and call that out. So this is the uh, current section here. Would you like me to read it out loud or? Sure, you for members of the public who might be listening, sure. Sure, um, so it's 16.19.070, discharge of sewage prohibited. No person shall cause the discharge of sewage to the storm drain system. In addition, if this determines that a building drain or a building sewer is not operating properly, and causes the discharge of sewage into the, sorry, to the street, sidewalk, or storm drain, the director may declare this condition to constitute a public nuisance and proceed to abate 
that nuisance in accordance with section 16.19.180. Okay. I mean, it's like that kind of covers no person, period, shall, you know, discharge sewage into the storm drain. And I will say it was, I actually am looking back at the um, red line version. It was really confusing to see this kind of inserted in the middle of um, chapter 10, because when I read section six, uh, it, uh, effective date, this ordinance shall take effect and be enforced 30 days after final adoption, provided, however, that the enforcement of section 10.40.020 shall not commence until the council passes a resolution confirming that either A, the city has implemented an enhanced state parking permit program for in-house residents who have vehicles. The issue is that because this came after um, chapter 16, the way I read this was that we weren't going to enforce um, the discharge of sewage until these safe, these safe parking programs were implemented. Now, obviously, reading, seeing this again, Section 6 deals directly with, um, you know, Chapter 10, but I don't know if somebody can clarify because this is a little yeah. confusing for me. There might be a typographical error there. Um, the intent was to defer enforcement of the overnight parking component uh, until a safe sleeping program had been established. Um, and I, I think that's section six is one of the provisions that the committee intends to continue to work on. So that, that I would say as of today is still a work in progress. Okay, it, it was really confusing because the way I read it, it seemed like we weren't gonna enforce discharge of sewage until these safe parking programs were up. And that to me makes absolutely no sense. Uh, yeah, and, and I, I'll just add to the planning director's comments that um, it is a little bit redundant, but it is clear that the language of the section that was just quoted is primarily intended to deal with um, sewage discharge from buildings. And so the, the Public Works Director's nuisance abatement uh, authority does not neatly apply to someone who empties their uh, black water tank into a storm drain. So of uh, having um, somewhat redundant language in the in the code. Yeah, okay. um, if I may add also, it was the adding of um, no person shall cause the discharge of sewage or gray water to the storm drain system, including but not limited to discharges of recreational vehicle holding tanks. So that was the, the added language. Okay, I think the order, it, it looks like the, Section 16 was kind of embedded within Chapter 10. So anyway, it was confusing, and thank you for the clarification. Um, I'll just make my final comments. Um, I think, you know, this homeless issue, is a, this is a national issue. And, you know, when we live in a community where homes that were once able to be purchased by working families are now only accessible by very affluent people because you have two-bedroom houses going for a million dollars and rents continue to go up while, while wages stay stagnant, we're only going to see this situation get worse, and we're not going to be able to currently build our way out of it. Um, with regards to the first recommended act or printed agenda, I want to say for the record that I'm glad we're not introducing this as an ordinance for publication this evening, because I would not be supporting the recommendation as it currently stands. And uh, in the future, I just think it would be good if we use different language when bringing items forward for community input, because when the community sees introduced for publication, that's a first reading. And that can really stir up uh, the community and many people's emotions, the intention of, of what we're hearing before us today. Um, I very much appreciate the work that's been done on this, uh, but based on public comment and the presentation, it's very clear that it still needs work. Um, just a few examples. It doesn't seem like there's a fee schedule that's been worked out for the permits. It seems like there may, may be a lot of unintended consequences that will negatively impact people who are not a nuisance that live in their vehicles and also put more people on the streets if their vehicles are towed and they have nowhere else to go. And I'm also really concerned with, um, you know, whether it's going to get appealed and, or whether this will be upheld by the Coastal Commission. Um, regardless of who's on the subcommittee, I just really encourage um, that my colleagues to create an inclusive process that engages with a diverse set of stakeholders and that the subcommittee takes its time so that we can have an ordinance that can have broad acceptance and support throughout the community. I'd be, it sounds like there are three council members who brought this forward who want to be on that subcommittee, but I'll also state that I'm happy um, to be on that ad hoc committee. 
as I mentioned before, I've worked at Long and Rain Lab and have worked there since 2015, so I encounter these the issues that are before us on a daily basis when I go to work. A um, couple recommendations. Um, consider providing longer-term permits for people who are not causing nuisance. That way we're clearly trying to address people who are, are problems and we're not trying to criminalize everyone who's homeless. Um, I very much think the county needs to be involved and it sounds like that's the case. I also think the AFC needs to be involved because I was a little shocked to hear that the person who runs the AFC program was saying that, you know, that is not a program that has received city funding and is not sponsored by the city. And it sounded like, you know, going into this conversation, they've been found. But um, if that's not the case, I would highly encourage that the AFC is, you know, at the forefront of this conversation at a minimum since they provide these services. Um, as with what the community members said, the six month residency program seems like a bit of a problem, um, especially for someone like a student who might be moving in or people who may be moving to Santa Cruz in general. And it sounds like it might be unconstitutional as well. Um, and it would, be, it would be good when this comes back for there to be a um, note in the gender report of who from the public has been met with um, to discuss this ordinance in order to provide transparency around who's being included in these conversations. I know that we've done this before with the Loudon Nelson Center. We've done it with the removal of the mission bells where we've clearly stated who has been involved in this process and the groups that they represent. And that is really critical so that we are making sure people are, you know, it's transparent of who is involved in these conversations and that we can see, you know, the diversity of people who are gonna be um, involved in these conversations. Um, that's all the comments I have. And um, I'm, I'd be, you know, I'd like to look to see what that motion looks like again, if those amendments made, you know, that I mentioned earlier around extending the time can be considered. Um, and regardless, I think I'll support the motion. It's just to continue this item and to create the subcommittee. We're not taking action on whether or not we're, we support or reject the ordinance that's before us. So um, I'll leave my comments there. Thank you. Thank you. Can you clarify, did you make a friendly amendment or are you just commenting? I expressed early on that rather than leaving that October 26th date, that we leave it open-ended. Um, we leave it open-ended and it's clear that this is an issue that um, I know the mayor has expressed she's, you know, is concerned with. Sounds like the vice mayor is also concerned with this. And so, you know, leaving it up to you all to determine what best date to bring it back is completely fine. And I think it provides flexibility, and allows the subcommittee to determine, you know, this has, had enough attention to where it should be brought back to the council. So if you have a set date, it usually ties your hands and I'm just trying to provide flexibility for whoever works on this. Thank you. It sounds, uh, it sounds like you're a comment versus um, a friendly amendment. Wait, you're muted, council member Cummings. I'll make that an official that we um, leave the date open-ended. So continue this item uh, to allow for consideration of public comment on the draft ordinance and to allow time to prepare associated updates to the ordinance language. Uh, okay, let's see, does uh, the maker of the motion accept the friendly amendment? I'm, I'm not interested in accepting the friendly amendment. We've had conversations today with the city attorney, with Lee. We made the decision um, that we wanted to continue this item and we feel prepared and ready that we would be able to go forward by that date. And does the seconder of the motion? Yeah, I yes, I agree with uh, with Councilmember Boulder. Okay. Uh, so I'm uh, moving on. Let's see. I see several hands. Uh, Councilmember Brown, and then Councilmember Watkins. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, so I was, I had made some comments that were um, a little more positive than I'm, what I'm about just made to hear. There's not any interest in um, taking a little more time on this because I think um, that the, um, you know, as Council Member Kalantari Johnson said, you know, um, we're, you know, this polarization, this, this challenging situation we're in, the polarization, is from doing nothing. I believe the polarization is from, um, you know, being hasty, not having that inclusive and diverse community input process that 
Council Member Cummings suggested is really essential to um, moving forward in a way that, that does not um, um, kind of continue to um, gin up the, you know, the emotions and, and the polarization. Having that process, I mean, I have no idea who you've all met with. I have no idea who you meet with in the next two weeks. Um, how will people, I mean, we heard from a lot of community members who um, are very concerned and how will they access providing input? Who are the stakeholders? There's no, I'm not hearing any um, response to that, that concern and I'd like to, and if I'll change my mind. Um, but um, I also, you know, I'm, I mean, I'll, so now I'll go back to the positive, <laughs> what I was trying to, hoping to be positive here. Um, you know, I'm, I'm pleased that there are council members um, who are interested in working on this. I'm pleased um, that at least ostensibly you're interested in um, engaging with the community around this. And I'm um, also happy to see that there's an, at, at a minimum an attempt to begin to talk about um, non-enforcement um, possibilities here, which I think had they been implemented sooner, we wouldn't be quite where we're at today. Um, I, I'm, so I'm, I'm glad that this is happening and I wanna be supportive of it, but I wanna see, um, you know, the community members who are stepping up and saying, no, this, you know, this feels like, um, you know, we're really criminalizing vulnerable people. I want them to have a voice in the conversation and not just a one minute at a city council meeting. Um, I, um, I'm also, uh, um, you know, a little dismayed uh, to be hearing kind of pretty different um, characterizations of what's happened with um, uh, in a couple of cases here with the vulnerable uh, people. And it, it doesn't seem to just be a difference of perspective on what's happened here with a, you know, 70 year old man and, you know, a family with children. Um, and I, I'm not here to, you know, get to the bottom of that. But I, the point I want to make is that um, there seem to be very, very different um, ideas about what's going on. And it's very hard to make a decision based upon, you know, hearing conflicting um, kind of information, not perspective, but information about what actually is happening on the ground. Um, the, um, I want to thank um, the ASC for <laughs> doing, you know, this, this, you know, I mean, we do, we lean on them. We, we cite, you know, we, we refer to them as like, the, you know, and we kind of put it in a box like, oh, it's okay. And they're, you know, we'll just keep, get that going. And, you know, maybe we can expand upon it. We don't even support it now. So, and the, the, they've been told there's no money for you. So the idea that that is something that we can just kind of lean on and feel good about it, you know, I, I just, it just rings a little hollow, I'm sorry to say, and I'd like to see that um, com that taken very seriously in the subcommittee's conversations. Um, I think um, it's, it's critical. I mean, if, if, if we, if, if we want to actually achieve the goals, the, the stated goals, um, creating a, another, an ordinance and then saying, well, we're going to talk about all this stuff and, you know, but we have to do this first. As with the CSSO, I don't believe is a productive way to move forward. Um, this is not about whether or not I agree, you know, I, I approve of, um, you know, vehicles that, you know, I believe there's a nuisance. I believe it is a challenge for people. I believe that people have reason to be concerned and want change. Um, I agree with that, but this is not gonna create the kind of change that um, I think people are, you know, there's a rosy picture being painted here. Um, sorry, my, my positivity kind of faded when I heard, no, we, you know, we're done. We're not going to, you know, we want community input, but we're not going to talk about this. We need to do it now. Um, it just doesn't give me a lot of, um, confidence that something, um, that really takes those concerns into account is going to come back to us. I hope I'm wrong. Um, and then, um, I guess the last thing I'll just say is, um, When I think about the experience that people have when they have nothing, I mean, Chief Mills said it, you know, um, we don't want to take away their, their, you know, people's last, um, you know, resource, but that is what's happening and that will continue to happen and it will happen um, in greater numbers um, if, we move, if we go in this direction without taking seriously um, 
what the what the city um, can do to support people. Um, you know, getting a car register or a vehicle registered costs a lot less money than apparently it costs to tow one. So why aren't we? You know, I mean, that is a, to say to just swipe that aside and say, oh yeah, that's true. Um, we're going to talk about that, but not really actually see a foundation for that conversation to happen or a space where that conversation might happen after we leave um, worries me. And so I'm going to, um, you know, I'll support moving forward with this, but um, it's very hard to imagine that um, that what comes back three weeks from now is, is going to, or four, a month from now that needs to be completed in two weeks time is going to address all of those kind of outstanding questions. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Uh, Council Member Watkins, and then Council Member Kalantari Johnson, and then Council Member Boulder. Um, I think I'll keep my comments brief, but um, in general, I guess I'll say is obviously this is a very complex issue. And, and, and not only is it a complex issue in regards to the human lives and our environment and all that we're trying to balance earlier, um, but it's a complex issue in terms of process and action and the role of a council in terms of policy direction and proposals and how we move forward. I think that um, having been on the council now for over four years, we've spent a significant amount of time trying to think about and talk about how to move forward with some solutions. And I feel my observation I don't feel clear from some of my colleagues what that looks like. And so I think for me, I struggle with how do we balance being in process, but also being in action? And what does that look like in terms of balancing the people's business? And it's brought before us in terms of our jobs here. We've meetings that have gone on for, for hours and, and we've had um, endless discussion and um, sort of broad definition of what we think is adequate process. So I don't think I need an answer tonight. And I see that, you know, some of my colleagues' hands have gone up and that's, that's fine if there is a response, but I think clarity that means to people will be helpful moving forward and defining how to move forward. Because kicking the can down the road um, into next year or sort of being okay with status quo essentially um, is a choice, then we can make that choice, or we can incrementally try to move forward with solutions as, as best we can, or we can, um, or we can, you know, aggressively solutions, which we've seen proposed and supported by some of my colleagues as well over the past. So I just really feel like there is, it's okay to say that there's a both and here, and that's not anything to um, shy away from because I think we're all seeking solutions, and I don't. Um, and tend to point fingers, or I just think naming is important. And moving forward with solutions is also important. And, and balancing process and action is our job. And as policymakers, we have the role to do that in a way that allows us to continue to do the people in all capacities and roles. We have big, big issues that come up, water, et cetera. So I, I, I think I, um, I hear the concerns, I understand the nuances. I think moving forward in a way that allows more time for consideration um, and not have this being a first reading, I, I really appreciate that. I appreciate uh, my colleagues recognizing that we can do that. And so I'm supportive of this direction. Sure, if there isn't um, enough time between now and then, you know, it's up to the mayor's discretion ultimately to agendize items. So. If there is uh, the need on the 26th for the mayor to have this continue due to um, incompleteness, then we'll accept that and, and we'll continue to move on with our jobs business. So I, at this point, the motion and um, recognize the nuances associated with all of it and the challenges associated. I understand all of the feedback we've heard in regards to those. Um, I recognize all of the um, comments that have been brought up by my colleagues, and um, I too want to work towards solutions because I think inaction is also a choice that, frankly, I'm just not okay with at this point. And I think we can actually get to a place where we can try to make 
people's lives better as well as protect our environment. So I, um, I, appreciate, I appreciate the discussion this evening and I'm happy to take the vote um, and call the question at this time in regards to the proposal that's been brought before us in terms of the motion. So I'll go ahead and call that question. Okay, the question has been called. That would be a, a, a motion to call the question. It requires a second. Thank you, Tony. I'll make a motion to call the question. I'll second that. Yeah, since the motion's been made in the second. Yes, uh, so now we will go to a vote. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Uh, so uh, roll call vote, please. So just to clarify, this is a vote to accept the, the motion. It is, a, it is a vote to call the question after which if it passes, the uh, motion will be taken up immediately without further debate. I know, I mean, what, yeah, I, I'm, I, and I will just say, because I've heard from my colleagues that they are pretty comfortable with or um, recognize the, the nuances of this motion and had stated previously that they were supportive. So I. Sorry, Johnson. I, um, and then I have a question for clarity. <laughs> um. Tony, should we get the question before we do the vote? Because it would halt discuss, further discussion, right? Um, yeah, I think that's probably appropriate. I just have comments, and my question was, do I hold those comments now that we've taken the vote? But I, I am also ready to take the vote. Yeah, so the motion to call the question would end the debate. Okay. Aye. Okay. Uh, Brown? No, because I have one more comment, and I'm not sure how that's going to, people's comments are going to fit in if we do this. So, no. Coming? No, and I'll just say we already limited the public's comments one minute. We didn't have a whole lot of public comments, I think. And this is a very important topic. So, I think if we provide people with an opportunity to speak, that would be best. Holder? Aye. Vice Mayor Brunner? Aye. And Mayor Myers is absent. So you may now proceed directly to vote on the motion that's on the floor. Okay, so we will move forward with a vote on the motion on the floor. By Council Member Golder, seconded by Council Member Kalantari Johnson to continue the item of the meeting, to continue this item to the meeting of October 26, 2021, to allow for consideration of public comments on this draft ordinance, and to allow time to prepare associated updates to the ordinance language, and two, to direct to work with an ad hoc subcommittee to be appointed by the mayor to establish a subcommittee and begin exploring what a safe parking program can or should include should one be established as part of or outside any future ordinance. May we have a roll call vote? Council Member Watkin? Aye. Helen Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Coming? I, and for the record, I think that we need to extend the time for when this needs to come back. Holder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers is absent. Okay, motion passes. Um, I would just like to say that we have taken all the comments tonight from the public as well as from all the council members. And uh, we will be, um, uh, 
uh, whatever the subcommittee is appointed, um, all of these notes will be taken into consideration for the first reading. And um, in the meantime, for anybody who did not, was not able to um, uh, call in for public comment, you can always email the full um, council at city, Santa, city of Santa Cruz com. So that's council at city of Santa Cruz com. We can also take handwritten letters or mail, mail, mail to the city council offices at 809 Center Street, room 10. Is that correct, Bonnie Bush? And, um, Sorry, I couldn't find my unmute. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Um, and um, other ways to um, reach out, you can email the council members individually, and um, we hope to get this, um, um, all of the comments um, have been noted and incorporated in before the first draft is brought back for a reading. And with that, is there anything I um, am forgetting? Otherwise, this meeting would be adjourned. This meeting is adjourned? Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Vice Mayor, for stepping in. Yeah, thank you thank so you. much. Thank you, everybody. Have Good a wonderful night, everyone. evening. Thank you. Thank Good you. night. Goodbye. <laughs>